It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. What a great panel we have for you. Dylan Tweeney is here. Nate Langson from Bloomberg. And our great buddy from Engadget, Devendra Hardawar. There's lots to talk about, including Samsung's folding phone fail, the mental health apps that secretly share your data, and ransomware attacks. Are they actually an act of war? It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit This Week in Tech, episode 715, recorded Sunday, April 21st, 2019. 8K plus 5G. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com slash IT to see what IT can be by giving their products a try for free. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. From the founders of Carbonite comes the cloud storage technology that's disrupting the industry. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial, and use the offer code TWIT. And buy stamps.com. Buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it, right from your desk. For our special offer, go to stamps.com, click the microphone, and enter TWIT. And buy Simple Contacts. Simple Contacts is an easy and convenient way to renew your contact lens prescription or reorder your contacts from anywhere within minutes. Get $20 off your first order by visiting simplecontacts.com slash twit and entering the promo code twit at checkout. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we get together with the best tech journalists in the world and discuss the latest tech news. Great to have Nate Langson on board, for all the way from the UK, where he is the tech editor at Bloomberg. Hey, Nate. Hello, Leo. Hello, guys. It's nice to be back. Nate will be doing a drum solo a little later on in the show. <laughs> yeah, if you're very, very lucky, because it is very late and my wife is asleep. So. <laughs> well, those <laughs> look like e-drums. You could, do, you could do the e-drum thing, patch it into uh, Skype, and uh, no one would no one would be the wiser. That is true, yeah. Yeah, that would be fun. That's when the band goes off and drinks Jack Daniels for half an hour. That is generally what happens. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what's keeping my wife asleep right now. <laughs> also here, Dylan Tweeney. He is, uh, well, you know Dylan for years. He's been everywhere, but right now head of communications at, uh, that sounds bad when I say he's been everywhere. He's had <laughs> a number of journalistic jobs over the years currently head of communications at Valley Mail, which is a way, or Valet Mail, which is a way of validating outbound email which good companies to be back. need to use really hi dylan to... yeah Great hey how you doing you. do you miss sometimes you know working at the the big tech publications you kind of wish gosh i wish i could rip off an editorial here or something like that uh you know it is easier to get people to call me back yeah and i of get course. uh when you know when 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 you're a journalist it was easier to get people to call me back and uh, i got invited to more parties so i miss those two things yeah, I've been doing this uh, so long that uh, I no longer get invited to anything. <laughs> <laughs> so it is possible to overstay your welcome. Shall we put it that way? <laughs> there we go. I, I wanted to switch lanes before yeah, that happened. Very, very smart. Formerly senior editor at Wired, when that's, I think, where Devendra Hardawar knows him from. Right, Devendra? No, it's at VentureBeat. VentureBeat. there. Okay, yeah. awesome. Devendra's senior editor in Gadget. He can hold a job. Howdy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been there. How long have you been there? Oh, uh, I think going on four years now. It's been a while, yeah. That's a in a, in internet years, that's like 400. Yeah, we've seen uh, so many different types of phones. Screen sizes have exploded since then. It's crazy. <laughs> well, let me ask you, because <laughs> uh, the Galaxy Fold uh, comes out at the end of this week. I was thinking of running down to my T-Mobile store on Friday, like plunking down a couple of, couple of big ones, a couple of thousand dollars, and uh, purchasing one until... Our friend Steve Kovac <laughs> said, my phone broke after two days. Our friend <laughs> Dieter Bone said, oh, there's a big bulge in the phone. Uh, our, my friend uh, Marquez Brownlee said, it's it's not working any. F I think four of the early reviewers all mm -hmm. had broken fold units. Joanna Stern, too, I think. Yeah. That's right, Joanna. Mm -hmm. Mark uh, Herman over at Bloomberg with us. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's five, six, seven. 
That's a bad sign for a new phone. When, when it's all, probably a really small sample group too. So it's like, oh, what is that ratio going to look like with uh, consumers? Like a hundred percent of product reviewers. So <laughs> it turns out that Steve Kovac and Marcus Brownlee, at least those two, maybe others, removed what looked like a temporary plastic coating. I know my S10 Plus had one. It was a screen protector, but removed it as I did on my S10. Uh, and it turns out there was a warning in the box that said, whatever you do, <laughs> do not remove this plastic film. I think they were saying there wasn't a warning. And then with future shipments, there was a there warning. There will be a so, warning. Yeah. I'm unclear. That's mm -hmm. not a good sign. I don't, you know, people not do good. not read warnings. Exactly. Well, and after too. years of pulling those useless plastic things off your new phone, that's going to be the first thing everybody does. Well, exactly. What are they thinking? Yeah. It, uh, it shows how quickly they rushed this out the gate, basically. Like, they had to get all this tech out there. They had to get a folding phone out there before all the other companies did. And, yeah, so instead of sealing that screen a little, uh, you have a v very visible layer right on top. It's crazy. And then uh, Dieter Bone at The Verge said, well, he did not remove his film, but he, he did have a bulge come up out of the hinge that broke the screen anyway. His review was entitled Broken Dream. <laughs> uh, it turns out they put a little bit of putty underneath the phone to prop it up during a photo shoot, and I think maybe that got into the hinge. Mm. So it is a, it is clearly a fragile beast. But yeah, I, I assume a lot of things are going to get into that that little bulge there. So but yours is yours is okay. I didn't gadget. Yeah, we haven't had any problems yet. Um, I mean, we're keeping an eye out for it, but it's going to be Chris Velasco doing the review. I believe our video's up already. And uh, Sherlyn Lowe did the hands-on. And it's, you know, I played with it a little. It's really cool, but that front screen is is not good. That front screen feels like a joke, honestly. And it just seems like Samsung really, really had to rush this out there to get their folding phone. Oh, that's interesting. Because uh, yeah. some of the early, uh, and when I say early, I mean in the first day, obviously, before the phone broke, uh, early uh, thoughts were that, hey, I get it. This is great. But you do have to make a sacrifice because that front screen is only, what, four inches, something like that. It's like 4.7, and it's really, really skinny. So it's kind of it's kind of useless, honestly. Like, you could do some very basic lookups with it. But I was thinking about, like, how would I use this phone, like, uh, on the subway or something or in a crowded way? And really, the only way to use the phone to its full potential is to open it up. And then it's a two-handed device. Then it's a tablet. So I don't – is that really more convenient for a lot of people? I don't know. Shellen wrote, it's fun to open and shut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe don't do that too much, Sherlyn. Uh, and uh, she does say satisfying despite the crease. The crease is another word I don't like to hear on a crease smart, is bad. smartphone. That, uh, and also the uh, which are the cameras up top. That That is such an ugly thing to see. Yeah. Oh, look at that I'll screen. I see the problem right there. There's there's uh, Sherlyn's picture of that screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the front screen. So, so Devendra, the, the, do you really other, think other... that people are going to be rushing uh, <laughs> folding phones out? Is this? Are we going to see a, a horde of these? We are. Well, we definitely saw a whole bunch, right? Didn't Huawei? Uh, they showed one off at Mobile World. Huawei's Congress, will be available later this yep. summer. So, uh, like yeah. a whole and slew I, of them got you could, announced. You could, at CES, there was another. Nobody, the Royal. <laughs> yep. Nobody cares about Royal. <laughs> but but, but nobody complained that the Royal broke after day two. Maybe nobody yep. bought it. Uh, we we broke the Royal during oh, during the you? CES preview. Yeah, during oh. the preview, that thing broke. Like it's. A mechanical, you know, a, a mechanical object, it's going to break more often than a solid phone. But, yeah, these things are trouble. They're all trying to rush them out this year, and that seems like a bad, bad decision. Well, you just saved me nine, one thousand nine hundred eighty bucks. <laughs> I think I was, I was thinking, well, I really ought to go out and and kind of validate the experience of uh, all these early reviewers. I we didn't get a review unit. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure you want to, Leo. Like, it's I think it's a cool thing for you to buy just to have that experience and see what it's like. Well, because, actually, now yeah. I think I'm going to hope it breaks right away so I can return <laughs> it and get my money back. I do, <laughs> honestly, buy it for 30 days. This is what I used to do before I could get reviewed. As I, Best Buy has a great return policy. A lot of places do. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, buy it, try it, and then return if you don't like it. Well, I can tell you the the the, the Huawei one. So I've I've used the the Huawei one and. When I was using it, it was the most excited I was about a phone oh. since the first iPhone. So I could not see a crease in that thing at all. I mean, I only got to use it for maybe 20, 25 minutes, something like that. Um, it was one of these behind closed doors, behind closed doors thing. The only restriction they put on me is that I wasn't allowed to personally fold it on camera. 
which is a really, really weird restriction to put on people. <laughs> but um, you could fold it yourself, just not on but, camera. You could fold, but I could fold it. And it is, it's from, I've seen, you know, I've seen the Royal, I've seen the, the Galaxy Fold, and none of them look like this. Like it yeah. genuinely, when it's folded out, <clears throat> the display, the, the how thin it is, like it, it's really weird. No one's bothered comparing it to, uh, you know, to a Kindle for very good reasons. It's about five million times as expensive. Yeah. But in terms of reading on this thing, like it is properly nice. Like it, mm -hmm. it is a beautiful, beautiful device. Um, and the, the screen is on the outside too, which I think is much more useful than a tiny useless display on the outside and the, yeah. the folding screen on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, a trifold. It the screen is on the outside. You open mm -hmm. it out, and it's the same screen. It just becomes uh, larger. You see both wings. Yeah, it just becomes this like really thin eight-inch tablet. Um, yeah, it's it's gorgeous. And and the screen, you know, I was the the main thing I wanted to find out with that thing was, can you see creases down the center of the screen? Because obviously on the on the Samsung, that's one of the things we've seen. And maybe this was a brand new straight out of the box unit. But I was, you know, I was bending it, I was looking at it in different lights, and and you can't really see like there is the tiniest, tiniest hint. Um, but it was very, very exciting. So if you're going to buy any of them, Leo, I would definitely go for that one for 30 days and then send no, no, it no. back. Nate, but, you misunderstand. You know, I'm buying them all. Okay, well, <laughs> right. that's, that's perfect. But it really is. At the end of the day, like anything that has moving parts, you know, the, the, we've, we've tried to move away from moving parts in almost everything. It's a reason why the iPad was so successful. Well, one of the reasons the iPad yeah, was so slabs. successful. They don't go anywhere. It has no, it has no moving parts. It has yeah. no fan. Yeah. So I, I kind of think it's a step backwards in one way, but um, but a step forward in a different one. Be interesting. Nate, Nate, I think you've convinced me that I want to wait for the Kindle version of whatever. <laughs> oh yes, is, so that I can read on an e-ink screen that's a comfortable size. But for oh, a yeah. phone, I, it's, I'm not persuaded mm -hmm. that I need that much screen or that much risk of the. I mean, it was already. The, yeah, there was a Russian company that 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 had a dual screen phone with an e-ink screen on the back and a color one on the front. I can't remember the name of it now, but um, they yeah, they're did bankrupt. Two or three. As a matter of fact, I'm just <laughs> reading about just them. This week. Just this it week, they went they went out of business. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Oh, well, was, that was the Yada phone. The Yada, yeah. Yada. That's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. But yeah. I think you're onto uh, something, Dylan. Like, I think if we could make an e-ink device that could fold out like this, like you could have something that feels like a paperback, and then you fold it out, and it's you know the size of like a magazine or something, and that could yeah. be really cool for a really niche audience. Yeah. There or it is. There's the Yada. I could just unroll it and yep. it'd be like a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's kind of where this all comes from, is that sci-fi notion of you've got a thing folded up in your pocket that you unfold. But mm -hmm. despite the fact that we can currently uh, un uh, roll up and unfold OLED screens, there's lots of other issues mm -hmm. about the electronics that are attached to it, the hinges, the screens themselves. I don't think we're the anywhere glass, close. Like there, there's yeah. not glass on these phones because they have to use plastic because right. you can't roll, you can't fold glass. Right. Yeah. So... Okay, they're too expensive. Clearly, I mean, these early versions were not intended for normal users. They were intended for a, a special, weird class of people that, for whom price is no object and having the latest thing that's <laughs> clearly different than everything else is, is worth that extra price. But, but if it's going to break right away... You know, this yeah. it reminds me of... Do you remember when, um, when Windows Vista was announced and we, we got those, those weird laptops that had like a little miniature screen on the outside of the device <laughs> where you could do like like a little bit of email checking and notifications and mm. you know there were loads oh, of these around mm -hmm. and everyone sort of thought like what's the point like why why does this exist and obviously it went away and we moved in a completely different direction and mm -hmm. i, I kind of get the feeling that we'll move we'll look back at these devices in a similar sort of way like nice experiment at right. the expense literally of the consumer mm -hmm. um but maybe it helps us figure out, okay, we don't want to go down that road. Cool. We'll go down this road. And maybe that's what the industry needs to do. But. Is the tech industry a particular offender here? I mean, I think every industry, I think the auto industry, tries stuff that, does, that doesn't pay off too well and then moves on. But the tech industry seems particularly prone to just throwing mm -hmm. spaghetti on the wall and hoping something sticks. Why is yeah, that? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's uh, we're we're addicts, right? We're innovation addicts. So they know like, people. Oh. They know we'll buy. It. They know people will buy it. They know people will buy it, but it, also, like, I think you look at the gadget hounds, the people who read in gadget and listen to Twit and everything. We're always chasing the next high, yeah, right? The the right. iPhone changed the world. That's right. Uh, so many things changed the world. What what is next? We're always searching for that. 
And, you know, I'm guilty of that, too. It's just I, I think I've reached a point where I'm like, I do like to take a step back and say, do we really need this? Should you buy this? Like this year, we're also going to see a ton of 5G phones. Nobody should buy those this year. Don't like don't forget how bad the early LTE phones were. Just Sam's, wait to see how those like Samsung's line. already selling its 5G Galaxy yep. S10. Yep. But the, I mean, it's almost pointless because where are you going to use it? Where are you going to use it? It's pointless. Yeah. 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 I think there are places I, you could use it, but. I think to vendor, it's got you. You you're, you've totally put your finger on one piece, which is the consumers uh, consumer side. Like we are totally obsessed about the latest new gadgets. There's also a, a, a product development side, which is that everyone in tech is completely bought into this agile development uh, mm -hmm. approach, more in software than in hardware. But I think it affects both sides. And that that the idea of that is like let's just ship it. Let's do two weeks worth of development, ship it, get it out the door, and then if something is broken, we'll fix it in the next two week sprint. Um, and I think that works really effectively for some things, maybe not so much for uh, folding OLED screens. For hardware, it's bad. You don't want to do that for hardware. For software, you can just iterate, like send an update, yeah. no problem. Hardware is a problem to do that with. I think Google's faced that issue over time, too, because they're such a software-focused company. Whenever they've yeah. produced hardware, it's been kind of problematic. And Amazon, I think, we've I think seen... has had a lot of issues as well mm -hmm. along the same lines. Fire and we've phone. seen it for decades. We've seen it for decades. I mean, you know, normally companies do this kind of stuff. They they have their R and D labs. They innovate this stuff, and they patent stuff. And and a lot of the time, it never comes out. You know, they build one, they do a prototype, and they say, yeah, this isn't going to sell. We're not going to ship this. So they check it to one side and move on. Um, but there's a cachet that now comes with being seen as an innovator, and everyone wants to be that innovator. You know, Samsung desperately needs to wants to be seen. Kind of needs to be seen as that that innovator. So it's bringing these things out, and it's let it's it's. It's essentially trying these out on the public without yeah. regard for whether they're actually going to be any successful or whether they're going to support them in five years time. Um, and that's just a change in the way I think these companies are operating. It's the R we are the R and D guinea pigs um, and it's it's at the cost of our wallets. Yeah. And I mean, they're coming off of a line of exploding phones, right? They push things. <laughs> that's so why far. I feel bad for Samsung. Exploding. It's like so, so I think I the S10 is, is an amazing new. I think the S10 is an amazing phone. Yeah. But yeah. then Samsung stumbles and it's it's um I feel bad for them. Yep. Is Apple Just better that. because they do this stuff behind closed doors? I mean, well, it's I don't uh, think they so. have better quality yeah. control. There's no yeah. doubt their quality control is better. Yeah, but you got to wonder do they have some magical <laughs> folding phone in the lab or they just not I mean Declining. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Apple's no. Apple's never really done like proper market research. Like, I think right. that's one of the differences. Like, Apple, Apple comes out with something and says you're going to need this for this reason, and 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 you'll create the need for it. This Whereas a lot true. of other companies, yeah. they do their market research, they go out, they say, okay, well, people want this. People are bored of form factors. They're bored of you know six inch black slabs of glass and and things. So you know, what can we do? What can we do that physically in a shop window or on a website? makes them excited and someone said what if they fold in half and someone yet <laughs> went great idea let's do that um well, yeah. look, and that's sometimes yeah i'm sorry nate sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't i mean uh nobody really wanted giant phones when samsung came out with the galaxy note line um but that kicked off a huge trend so um you know i think they throw a lot of spaghetti against the wall and sometimes it sticks and sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't apple does have regional. a patent for a folding phone you have to oh, think, yeah. though, if they've got one in the uh, lab somewhere, that they're going, yeah. <laughs> dodge, a dodge right? the bullet on that one. There's a difference that, you know, they, they patent tons of stuff that never comes out. You know, they yeah. they patent stuff. The fact that there's an entire blog dedicated only to like posting Apple patents, Patent like, Apple, like they, yeah. they post yeah. this stuff just in case somebody else develops it and they don't want to lose the, mm -hmm. you know, royalties or whatever. But um, but they, with the Galaxy Note, it's a really good example, Dylan, because I think that was something that really did take off in 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 the Asian market. You know, they that was a big deal. People really liked those huge devices, but over here in the U.S. and in Europe, we were like, "Dude, why would you want a phone that's twice the size of other phones?" Um, yeah. And we just right. took a little while to catch up. And yeah. also, the hardware got better too. Like the big screen phones got slimmer, the bezels got slimmer, so they became more holdable and usable. So it, everything kind of con con congealed, I guess, into one spot. But Nate, you're onto something there. Like with Apple, their design's always very top down, right? You're gonna like this. You're gonna like a MacBook Pro with no usable ports. You're going to like a keyboard <laughs> with no travel. Deal with it. And yeah. I, I don't think quality control has been better for them, honestly. I think they've been faltering, too. Look at those MacBook keyboards. But it's a very different philosophy than, like, Samsung or Google or something. 
Uh, there's a, I, I, it kind of ties into uh, something I read this week. It was actually a blog post from a few years ago. Uh, a speech by Claude Shannon that was never published. Claude Shannon, of course, one of the uh, great theorists in computer sciences. If you don't know his name, you know, read the Wikipedia article. But he gave this speech in 1952 at Bell Labs. was not widely published uh, about creative thinking. And he said a small percentage of the population produces the greatest proportion of the important ideas. And he talks a lot about this. It's funny. It's co just coincidental. But a lot about this idea of uh, innovation. And one of the reasons he says it happens, particularly in the tech sector, <clears throat> is because people are dissatisfied. Um, things could be done better. I think there's a neater way to do things. I think it could be improved a little. There's a continual irritation when things don't look quite right. And I think that dissatisfaction, he wrote, is present in present days is a key driving force in good, now he called it scientists, but of course it was quickly technologists. Uh, but I also think that there is a intense pressure from the stock market and investors and the market in general to come up with the next new thing mm -hmm. and and even just pride what's the next new thing and unfortunately Je we're the guinea pigs for that <laughs> Je jeff bezos has a phrase that he used which really irritates me but i think gets to the same point that uh claude shannon made which is uh bezos talks about divine discontent and how uh, the customer is never satisfied for very long with anything that uh, that you provide them. So, um, uh, so for Bezos, he interprets that as a need for the company, you know, for any tech company really to continually innovate yeah. and continually be moving forward. Because last year's totally amazing thing is something that you know everybody has now, and you're like, ah, eh, could be better. We wondered with the exploding uh, note, was it the note seven, the note eight, with the exploding note, if that would be a permanent, you know, mark on Samsung. And they seem to have completely dodged that bullet. Oh, yeah. Will the failing folding phone <laughs> be the Ooh, next? Oh, that sounds uh, good. I like that headline. <laughs> nice. Be, be the next black mark on Samsung? And will it uh, no. have a lo lasting impact? People are incredibly forgiving of tech companies. I mean, look at what happened with Facebook and the Cambridge Analytica stuff. You know, their stock plummeted. Um, there were calls for resignations. There was a giant, you know, a new movement in terms of privacy awareness, awareness globally. And it's, you looked at it today, you know, a year later, and its user numbers are higher than ever. Its ah. stock is higher than ever. It's just like, Trust no one cares. Nuts. Nobody People cares. Care for a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. In tech, in tech. Yeah. Like, it's quite specific to tech. People are extremely forgiving in in the technology world and broadly speaking they are it's not just it's not just the geeks you know like us who, who will talk about this stuff and actually the real world is very different it's the opposite way around and and i think you know people just forgive tech companies because they just want Maybe. the latest and greatest i mean ford survived the exploding pinto <laughs> we'll that's see. a lot worse than an exploding <laughs> i think so uh you know i we'll see Look at Boeing today. Like, they're going through Well, a, that's a interesting. Lot. And Southwest yeah. just announced it wants to buy a whole bunch of new 737 Maxes. Yeah. I mean, there is... Figure that out. Figure that out. Because are you going to screw it up twice? Are you going to screw it up twice? Yes, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> Would you fly in a 737 Max right now? And there now? was also that story about how lax they're... Basically, they're, R &D, a, they're testing it. Yeah, for the and, Dreamliner. Yeah. New York Times big expose this Sunday on uh on from people working inside the factory at Boeing and how lax the processes are for building the the Dreamliner that's a little worrying that's actually a good illustration of the software uh agile software development thing which is i don't know if they're using an agile methodology in Boeing or not but they the reason that they started having stalling and out of control problems is they pushed a software update right. which was designed to make the plane more efficient move fast and break things Exactly. And don't train people. But yeah. not on airplanes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> but, but you notice Facebook doesn't say that. Anymore. That used to be their motto. They don't say that much anymore. Um, but I think it really is, at least tacitly, the motto of, <laughs> motto of Silicon Valley. Move well, fast. Facebook moved fast and broke democracy. So now they can't say it anymore. <laughs> right. You, <laughs> do, you think, gonna, do you think all that one line? Of the nice... <laughs> One of the nice details in Fred Vogelstein's story about Facebook and uh, in Wired this week was... Oh, man, is that said, a story? Wow. Oh, my God. And it has so many great details. But there's one detail, which is he sort of throws aside these little tidbits that he picks up during reporting. And one of them was, well, they're not really saying move fast and break things anymore. But if you go to their headquarters, 
the Wi-Fi password is still move fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's not totally gone there. The, the attitude is not totally over. This is an amazing uh, story, which recounts a lot of the uh, stuff we already knew. I mean, uh, uh, apparently, uh, Nicholas Thompson and Fred Vogelstein have been working on it for a long time. Uh, Jeff Jarvis said he ran into, I think it was Nicholas at Davos two years or last year, uh, and he was writing the story then. Uh, and in fact, it starts uh, in Davos uh, and the special Facebook, you know, suite or hotel room they had in Davos where they were uh, planning a temporary headquarters uh, where they were planning the it was more like a bunker one that, one that saw a succession of tense meetings with the same tycoons ministers and journalists who had agreed with George Soros when he said uh, earlier uh, the owners of the well I guess basically the Facebook's days are numbered the owners of the platform giants consider themselves the masters of the universe, Soros said, but in fact they're slaves to preserving their dominant position, I would agree. Davos is a good place to announce that their days are numbered. Uh, that was a year ago, more than a year ago. Uh, let's talk, we'll talk about Facebook because there's a lot to say about Facebook. Um, this, is a good, this is a good example of a company that, as you pointed out earlier, uh, can survive almost anything. <laughs> Uh, black marks everywhere. We'll do that in just a little bit. But <laughs> first, hey, we've got a great panel. Devinder Hardware here from Engadget. He's senior editor there. Uh, Dylan Tweeney, great to have you back now. Valamail, many years at Venture Beat and uh, Wired and many other places. And uh, of course, all the way from the UK, where it is in the middle of the night, Nate Langson, tech editor at Bloomberg. But I really appreciate your staying up late with us. Thank you. You don't have Game of Thrones mania in the UK, do you? No, I'm one of the seven people that doesn't actually like it. Oh, my God. Oh, it's also <laughs> delayed there, too, so I feel bad for UK Game of Thrones fans. It, yeah, it doesn't do. air the same night. Yeah, I don't know. I think we. I think they did air it on the same at the same time, but it was like 3 a.m. last week or something. I don't know. We've, there's some deal, but I don't know. My, my wife knows Game of Thrones it. is a lot like Facebook to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> hate it, really but you can't quit it. Like after the Red Wedding, and I, no spoilers here, but after the Red Wedding, I said, I'm never watching this show again. That is the worst <laughs> the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh. What a way to end a season. Uh, I'm devastated, and I'm never watching this show again. Of course, the minute it comes back in the next season, I'm glued to the TV. <laughs> it's just like Facebook. You can't leave it. I think they got off to a pretty good start, though, uh, last Sunday. So we'll get this over before uh, Devendra has to rush off. <laughs> Exactly. Because yes. I have a feeling you are watching it. Yeah, you'll just see a cartoon cloud of me running away. <laughs> if we go, yeah. <laughs> Rita's this... got a whole nother podcast about Game of Thrones. Yeah, I know. Got... Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And movies. I'm wearing a Game of Thrones shirt right now. I got this at South by for the blood donation thing. So it's the Iron Throne in like blood splatter form. Perfect. It's fun. Nice. <laughs> Does it actually say Game of Thrones or anything? Or are you just supposed to recognize it? Says it says Game of Thrones on the back, but oh, I think okay. it's more of like a South by insider thing. Yeah. It's like, oh, you, you donated blood to Game of Thrones. You got this shirt. Yeah, I recognize cool. that. That's the uh, yeah. that's the Iron uh, Throne uh, in blood. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, 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 it's one Iron Throne. It's one Iron Throne. So I was having this conversation earlier mm -hmm. this evening here. That shouldn't the name of the show be Games of Throne? <laughs> <laughs> if it's one Iron no, Throne. No, the Iron not... Throne is the prize, but they're littler thrones. They're smaller okay. thrones, yeah. Because you, you get know, to beat that, yeah. yeah to you could be king room. of the north, but that doesn't mean you get to sit on the. By the way, uh, the bigger question is why would you want to sit on a chair made out of knives <laughs> and swords? <laughs> Honestly, does that not it? look that comfortable. It's kind of a bad. <laughs> Bad sign too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's just yeah. It does, it's not. It doesn't look good. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, there were a lot of memes that came out of the first episode last week, and again, no spoilers. But uh, my favorite meme was the no elephants meme, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was it was the funniest thing ever, and somebody said, and I think this might be true, that this was a little jab by the writers at HBO that wouldn't give them the money to do the CGI elephants. <laughs> so, so, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say Cersei said, where's the elephants? There are no <laughs> elephants, m'lady. What? <laughs> There's no, HBO wouldn't pay for them, m'lady. 
<laughs> our show. Our, that's not a spoiler. Is that a spoiler? I'm bad with spoilers. That's You're not good. a spoiler. No, I think that's okay. Uh, they're going to be. I'm going to get email from people said what? There are no elephants. Maybe they're going to have elephants later. This was a tease. Our show today brought to you by Atlassian. If you're in IT, I you know we were just talking about Agile, right? Everybody knows Jira, right? It's like if you're doing Agile, you're using Jira. And we use Jira not just for uh, software development. Our IT team uses it to keep track of projects, who's doing what, what stage the project's at. One of the things I really like about Atlassian's tools, and there are a whole bunch of them, is it's all about, well, not just getting the job done, of course, that's key, but communication as well. In a modern enterprise, in a cloud-based world, IT teams are at the center of everything. And not only do they have to plan and execute, they have to do it faster than ever, they have to do it right, they have to be open, agile, they have to coordinate between operations and software development teams. Expectations are high, the stakes are high, and IT is smack dab in the center. And you don't get to fail, you got to get it done. So, of course, the best IT teams use Atlassian. Not only Jira, but we also use Confluence because it's very important when you get something done to document what you did so that people understand that people who come after you the, can, can say, oh, this is how it works. So we use Confluence like crazy. And the whole idea that you can use these tools like Jira and Confluence, Bitbucket if you've got a source code database, and never leave, not have to use some third tool to get the job done really encourages communication. Uh, and I think that's so important. IT tools, not just for developers. Atlassian offers an affordable, reliable suite of tools for all kinds of teams, all sizes, from DevOps to Agile to IT apps to Ops to ITSM, whatever is next. Atlassian provides a technology backbone to help modern IT organizations plan, service, and support exactly the kind of change that propels business. So I mentioned Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, but there's lots more. There's for people who have managed Ops, there's Ops Genie status page that'll help teams better detect incidents, coordinate response efforts, resolve issues faster. And once again, this thing that for me at least is really important, keep customers and stakeholders and the boss updated. Communication is so important. Your team can choose the right tools for your current framework, but trust that as you grow, as your needs change, Atlassian has something for you. They will grow with you. And of course, everything integrates seamlessly. Your team doesn't have to bounce from platform to platform. Like all of Atlassian's products, the tools for your IT team are easy and free to try. Just head to Atlassian.com slash IT and find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team. We're really proud here at Twit to say we're in Atlassian House. You should be too. Try Atlassian today so to see what IT can be. Atlassian.com slash IT. Let's talk about, <clears throat> oh, and by the way, we thank Atlassian for their support. Uh, let's talk about uh, Facebook because <laughs> it's just an endless litany. The I do absolutely recommend Fred's uh, great article on Wired, 15 months of fresh hell inside of Facebook. <clears throat> were there, I don't, Dylan, tell me, were there things that uh, weren't widely known in here or is it just really kind of putting it all together? Uh, I don't think there's a lot that was uh, really widely known. Cambridge Analytica. Other than, and yeah, there's there's some there's some uh, I don't know inside baseball about the movements of various executives that I hadn't heard before, hadn't heard all spelled out. But mostly, it's just weaving the whole story and uh, painting the picture of just how crazy and um, and I, I guess I would have to say inept. Uh, Facebook's responses were over the course of 2018 to the various scandals that em embroiled it. Seems to me um, even anybody just paying the slightest attention to it would quickly come up with the idea that Mar that Facebook would just do whatever it wanted to, get caught, apologize, say it wouldn't do it again, and then the whole cycle would repeat. Yeah, <laughs> Endlessly. I mean, and sometimes they didn't even apologize. Sometimes they just spent like, you know five days sitting there going like, what are we going to say? What's our response? What, you know, and then they'd come out and they'd solve a different problem. You know, the problem was with data leakage and they'd say, okay, we're going to fix this problem with, uh, you know, untrustworthy news. And their solution is, you know, some completely half-assed thing that, uh, you know, shows they don't really understand the news business and they didn't really talk to anybody in news and then it doesn't work for a year. And then they pull the plug on that. It's just like, I, it seems very, um, at least the picture that Fred paints 
um, lines up with you know what I've seen from other coverage, which is just yeah. that they don't really have their arms around the problems that they're causing in what, any serious way. What they mm -hmm. add, though, also is the behind the scenes, you know, kind of machinations going on. They talk a lot about why Systrom left, uh, mm -hmm. why Chris Cox left, and it confirms everything you know they the, those guys said at the time, but also everything we suspected. I guess um, it's kind of like the Mueller report. It's like you you knew all this, but now you're seeing it in print, right? Yeah, it just confirms what we know. Also, best Facebook move, drop terrible news in an old blog post during the Mueller report release. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Bravo. Bravo. Oh, man, yes. you're talking about the Perfect. Instagram password debacle. Yes. So first, Facebook says, first, it stored thousands of passwords, uh, Instagram passwords, unencrypted on its servers. By the way, this is a week after we found out that Facebook passwords were also stored unencrypted on their servers. Then, timed perfectly on the same morning that the Mueller report came out, Facebook said, oh, it's not thousands, it's millions of Instagram user passwords. And now, they did this by revising the existing blog post. <laughs> just like quietly, like, oh, we're just going to change thousands to millions. No one will just notice. Just add some zeros. We need to be notified. Oh, my God. What? <laughs> now, I have to say, it's not the worst news in the world. It wasn't publicly published. It was internal, but it meant that anybody who worked, meant not anybody, but many thousands of people who worked at Facebook had access to these passwords. Facebook said, as far as we can tell, you know, nobody used them in any <laughs> malicious way, but yeah. they could. They could. Probably not the best sign for one of the biggest companies in the world. That's all. It's bad. Like, it's just bad. Yeah. It's bad uh, operations. It's bad practices. Mm -hmm. You would expect them to um, know better. Mm -hmm. I, so I think it I, could be a function of them just being too big, too. Like, who knows what all these contractors and other people who have access to this data are doing. Maybe they're too big to even manage everybody effectively. Well, that's a good My point. sense is that oh, for years, nothing mattered at Facebook other than growing user yep. numbers and growing engagement. And they would basically do anything to increase engagement and get people spending more time on the site. And I think the result is, you know, there may be, it may be that um, Zook and, and Cheryl and other people at the top are actually honestly wanting to control things now. But there's so much momentum and so much culture behind this at Facebook now. And everything has been designed to facilitate engagement um, without, you know, any kind of breaks on that or any kind of controls or any kind of meaningful vetting built in from the start. So what they're trying to do now is like slow down the runaway train or like install a brake system on the train or safety controls on the train while it's already going 180 miles an hour down the track. Um, I, you know, it, it's just, it's, to me, it's, it feels very consistent with the way Facebook has been run for years that they just don't care about anything except growth. And mm -hmm. um, it's going to take a long time for them to change that, even if they really want to. Definitely. I guess the question, and maybe there's no answer, is what are what is going on in Sandberg and Zuckerberg's heads? Like, are they, is it, as you said, kind of innocent, Dylan, and it's just that it's too hard when you're this big and moving this fast to get it right every time? Oh, I didn't say innocent. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one I possibility. I mean, that they're not malicious. And then the completely other end of the scale is that they are, you know, Machiavellianly malicious actors who are just covering up as fast as they can. I don't, you know, if you had some like monopoly fat cat billionaire saying, oh, I, I don't care about anything except making money. I'm just going to prioritize making money. You'd be like, uh, I have kind of sort of a, some moral <laughs> issues with that. Right. There, there might be some things you'd want to be concerned about besides making money. I, I think it, you could fairly call that malicious yeah. or or at least um, a you know, more. How about apprehensive. amoral? Not immoral, amoral. but amoral. OK. All right. So Facebook Definitely. is amoral. So they we, could we be can, chaotic can, evil. <laughs> or chaotic neutral. Or chaotic neutral. <laughs> I don't think they're good. Nerds. I don't yeah, that's very nerdy. Let's roll they're the six sided dice. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they're that's what Zuckerberg people, does. Though, just like saying. with all of these things. Like how do how do we respond? Roll the dice. Let's, let's just go. <laughs> if the part of the reason this is important is 
going forward. Well, can can is it reasonable to say there's there's a path forward where Facebook will be a responsible actor or it sounds to me like that might not even be doable. I don't I don't think we can trust these companies at this point. Like they've proven time and time again that they don't know how to basically rule themselves. And I've said for a long time that it seems like the way we've kind of uh, controlled or at least stopped bad actors in the past uh, is through like some sort of government regulation. We did that with Ma Bell. Uh, you know, it's happened before yeah, but, and that helped prevent <laughs> monopolies. But yeah, it's the it's timing a big, it's is, a big is as bad as it can get because. Oh, yeah. Do you really want the? Is this the time the government should get step in? Not this government, but who? like, it, yeah, <laughs> some government, things, not our government. Bad. Not our government, but also like we need we need you know legislators let's who actually the, know what's going on. Let's get Parliament to do it. The they seem to be quite well organized these days. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're definitely doing everything that everyone wants. <laughs> this. I mean, um, you know, they they tried to get Zuck to appear, right? They've tried to get Facebook to answer for what happened during the Brexit election, and he just they, blows yeah. them off. He yep. he does, and I and I've met with um with the with the guy the the lawmaker. His name's Damian Collins. I've met with him before. He's the guy that chairs these committee meetings where you know they've they've done some very deliberately um sort of pre stunts. For example, when they demanded Zuckerberg appear and he wouldn't, what they did is they they put a seat out for him. They put a Zuckerberg <laughs> nameplate. <laughs> and then they published the photo that basically just looked like he was he, he was absent, that he just yeah. hadn't shown up. Yeah. Um, and of course, everyone used the picture. And they 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 do try. I mean, the thing that they're trying at the moment to do is to prevent companies like Snapchat to you know from having these streaks features because they're they're very they're very concerned that technology is is addictive in such a way. That long term, it'll be extremely detrimental for children. Um, so they don't want Snapchat having streaks. They don't want Facebook having the like button. Um, and that's where a lot of their attention is right now. Mm. That's that sounds I mean, like you know, micromanaging product design. I'm not sure that's an effective yeah. uh, 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 approach, but I, I well, don't know. We owe Parliament a little debt of gratitude mm -hmm. because... Uh, last year, Parliament was investigating Facebook and obtained a with kind of in kind of scary means obtained a, a trove of documents, uh, documents that had been uh, given uh, in the discovery in another lawsuit by a uh, a <laughs> an application called Bikinis that was designed to uh, <coughs> show up bikini pictures of friends and friends of friends on Facebook. And uh, Facebook shut down Bikini's access to the friends of friends information, everybody else's as well. And so they sued. Uh, and in the suit, there was a, um, of course, discovery, 4,000 page trove of documents, including emails, uh, internal company documents. Then the head of Bikini's was staying in a hotel in England and got tricked into handing, he says, tricked into handing them over to Parliament. Uh, now they've been leaked, and NBC News had a big story. Uh, and I don't know about their interpretation. It's hard to tell because they don't quote these documents directly. They mostly just publish uh, their interpretation of it. The headline, Mark Zuckerberg leveraged Facebook user data to fight rivals and help friends leaked documents show Facebook's responses. Well, they, those documents are cherry-picked for a lawsuit in a different matter. <laughs> Never, nevertheless, uh, at least some of the quotes are pretty... Shocking. Facebook, for instance, according to NBC, uh, decided to give plenty of data about users to Amazon because Amazon had decided to use Facebook to market its Fire Phone. But then when there was a messaging app that Facebook thought it was competitive, they cut off access to data, user data, to the messaging uh, application. Um, there's... I don't. I don't. I, did you guys read this stuff? And 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 yeah. do you think that NBC's interpretation is fair? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of thought goes into this, and I know that um, Olivia Solon, who's one of the two reporters on the byline, um, you know, she's very thorough. I've worked. I worked with her for many years. She's a good friend of mine, and, and I do sort of trust that, you know, when when she comes out with something like this, you know, she's gone through this with a tooth comb. So I, I do think that the the interpretation is pretty good. Um, and you are talking about four thousand pages of documents. You know, I saw 
when they previously released, I say they, it was Parliament. Over yeah, four hundred pages in the UK. released initially. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and they were, and they and they published a lot of those um, with redactions, and I, I had a copy of of a lot of those and was going through it. And on the one hand, you can see why Facebook would argue that things have been cherry picked because clearly they they have. You know, you have to pick certain documents out and certain sentences out. But at the same time, there are still email chains within these documents where you can see who said what and who replied to whom, and and then what was said then. And like, you can't make that up. Like they're not they're not publishing one email and then redacting four and then another one. Like you can see that conversation take place, and a lot of those conversations had Sheryl Sandberg as the sender. Some of them had Zuckerberg as the sender, and it's pretty clear. And and you know the killer example for me and the one that I used as an example in my story for Bloomberg back when this came out was about cutting off data to Vine because because. Twitter saw Vine as this big competitor, um, and they and they didn't want Vine essentially being able to uh, piggyback off Facebook's data and, and Facebook's user base in order to grow uh, what they saw as a rival service. and And it's well worth looking at because you could even if you are taking it out of context, like the words in the email are right there. You know, Zuckerberg knew what was going on for those things, and and maybe even uh, more uh, damning uh, than that. Um, Olivia writes uh, that. Often, in, she writes, however, among the documents, like, there's very little evidence that privacy was a major concern of Facebook, and the issue was rarely discussed in the thousands of pages of emails and meeting summaries. But where it is mentioned, it's often in the context of how Facebook can use it as a public relations strategy to soften the blow of sweeping changes to developers' access to user data. That, that When they did think about privacy, they thought about it only as a way to market Facebook to the public, mm -hmm. but we saw as... the other way around. We saw it with the other way around as well. With the with the there was in in the previous batch that it was included in these four thousand um, pages. There was there was discussion around an update to the Android app, uh, you know, Facebook on Android, and there was discussion in those emails about you know that a PR strategy was prepared in advance because they knew that they were essentially slipping this out into into the public and they needed to have a response ready just in case it, it kind of blew up so they're aware of these things you know they've, they've got their pr strategy in case it goes wrong and they and they're essentially weighing everything up risk versus reward when it comes to testing these things yeah you're absolutely right yeah good for the world but not good for us was one of the phrases zuckerberg uh, wrote. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. Yeah, that nothing. Yeah, it's totally innocent. Nothing to hide. Uh, that's a very You're... James Bond villain kind of thing to say. <laughs> Mr. Bond, that would be very good for the world. Not, but not good so for, good for me. <laughs> there was also you know, the, uh, the TED Talk this week that you guys should uh, should watch, too, by the Guardian journalist. I forget her name. But it was a very compelling color. talk about basically everything Facebook knew about how they basically help facilitate Brexit and everything like, you know, this is all reporting that's happened, but seeing it all condensed to 15 minutes is kind of a mind you know, blowing yeah. thing. Who is it? Carol Cadwallader. Carol yeah. Cadwallader. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good talk. And then there's the yeah. New, New York times article. It's not just Facebook. There's a New York times article about apps. Uh, it was a study um, of 36 apps the the in the study they downloaded apps that specifically were uh, had keywords with depression and smoking cessation. Some of these apps were designed to kind of support people who are going through emotional difficulty. Some of them designed uh, for people who uh, were trying to quit smoking. Of the thirty six apps uh, downloaded, thirty three of them sent private mental health information out to third parties including in some cases food diaries, health diaries, self-reports about substance abuse associated with usernames. This was uh, published Friday in the Journal of American mm. Medical Association Network Open. Um, so these apps, and we've seen this again, this isn't the first time, and the, Wa the Wall Street Journal also uh, reported that uh, Flow, the menstrual app, was telling third parties when women were on their periods. Mm -hmm. Not just third I mean, parties, but their employers, oh, their great. bosses. Oh, great. yes. Okay. That also explains the rise of all the like pregnancy tracking apps and everything too. Like there is a big business in collecting this data and selling it and really not telling people what's happening. I, yeah, I feel like consumers have to be more aware of the fact that they can't really trust 
all these random apps that they're playing with, even if they look nice and slick on their iPhones or something. Half the apps did not disclose third-party data sharing. Nine apps had no privacy <laughs> policy at all. Okay, well, don't download those. Five <laughs> apps did, but didn't, but lied. They didn't say the data would be shared this way. Three apps actively said this kind of data sharing would not happen. Those last three, uh, according to uh, The Verge, stood out to Stephen Chan, a physician at the Veterans Affairs Palo Alto Healthcare System, who s says they're basically lying. They're lying. They're saying, oh, no, we don't disclose this. A lot of times they say it in kind of uh, anodyne language like under the third party sharing. We share with third parties <laughs> to make our app work better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In other and words, everybody says that. So we get paid more, so we can continue to make this app better, or whatever, you know. Uh, so, and this, it's not this just is, this Facebook, I guess, is the mm -hmm. point. Yeah, and this is, but that that particular thing has been happening for for quite a long time. Like I remember reporting on um, Face, uh, not Facebook, sorry, PayPal's uh, user agreement, which is like it's. <laughs> It's 50,000 words long or, or was at, at one point. You know, it's longer than some novels. And the fact is you can defend in court. You can say, well, look, we, we had this here in this document that you agreed to. And the fact is that that's technically OK, even though the document is 50,000 words long and written in complex legalese that no real person can understand. Um, and there's, you know, there's a need for a change there. I mean, that's going down the route of GDPR, which I think everyone's kind of bored with at this point. But but yeah, these terms and conditions are very, very problematic, I think. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it it's boring, I guess, in our circles, but the GDPR, we're asking, like, what do we need? How do we stop these companies? And really, that's that's it. It's not perfect, but it's a start towards, like, really focusing on privacy and data and what it means to users, uh, promoting, you know, uh, easily understandable user agreements and really making sure people are aware of what these companies are doing. We definitely need something like that in America. We're kind of getting some side benefit to it because now everybody has to update for that. Yeah, but now it's not just personal privacy. Now it's a little bit more of a three alarm fire, as yep. Carol Cadwallader points out, because this data is also being used to suborn democracy. It's being used by the Russians in the United States and in, in the UK to change election results. And uh, that seems to me a pretty serious matter at this point. Uh -huh. Yeah, she called it uh, the largest uh, election fraud in the UK in 100 years. It's well, hard for the, people to wrap their heads. It's hard even for me to wrap my heads around it because it, it, it isn't like you broke into voting machines and changed the tally. It's much more subtle than that. Mm -hmm. But as we learned from the Mueller report, the Russians were organizing rallies in the United States that, you know, <laughs> appeared to be patriotic Americans and, in fact, were Russian actors, you know. Yeah. Using even Craigslist for that. It's insane. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I, I, th I wonder, I don't know. I talk to people, uh, non-tech people uh, with differing political views of mine. Obviously, I'm a raging liberal. And... Um, they don't seem to be too convinced by any of this. Yeah, they're not worried. I've definitely talked to people who aren't so concerned by it and maybe slightly more on the libertarian side of things. Um, I Often think they just tell me, oh, yeah. it's sour grapes. You lost. Yeah. Oh, boo-hoo. In some way, they're probably benefiting from all these broken rules and from you know companies basically doing whatever they want with our data. So yeah, as long as it's helping them, they're they're not going to argue is against it, the, it. Is it not the case that it, at least one thing you could say from the Mueller report is it's very clear how much Russian involvement there was, how active it was, how mm -hmm. aggressive it was about throwing the election uh, to Donald Trump. I mean, not that he, yeah. I, I'm not even saying he wouldn't have won otherwise, but it was very clear they were working hard. Yeah, that much is clear. And I think as much as we could tell from the report, the Trump administration was aware. The only thing they couldn't prove is that they were working together, which seems like, right. okay, all right, sure. Well, aware or not, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think we can leave that part out. That's that's a that's more of a diff that's a political discussion. Mm -hmm. um, this is, but this is all a political political discussion, right? Like, but it's also a technical discussion. Tech yeah, it's yeah. the intersection. Tech, but it, but it's also germane because if the people in power don't want to acknowledge it, then there's no way you can fight it in future elections. Exactly. What is it like in the UK? Is it generally understood that the Russians uh, wanted Brexit? No, 
it's pretty well understood in the broad sort of public consensus that it was the 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 politicians that were doing yeah, a lot you had of lovely lying. people like nigel farage <laughs> yes he's a lovely gentleman i respect him dearly um <laughs> Uh, you know, we had, for example, you know, the, the one that everyone gets is 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 we had this giant red bus, this like double decker bus that said, you know, we should be sending the 350 million pounds a week that we're sending to yeah. Brussels, to yeah. Europe. We should be sending that to our national health service. And everyone knew at the time that that was a ridiculous claim to make. It and was afterwards, a lie. It was a lie. It was not true, you know, and it doesn't account for the, you know, what you get in return for money that is sent over. So anyway, that's the thing that people are really angry about. And, and I think that overshadows the sort of accusations of Russian meddling, uh, at least in the sort of broadest senses. Yeah. And, the, and there's no evidence that the big red bus was uh, was Russian organized. No, it was the Nigel. Big red bus. I actually tracked it down um, and I found <laughs> the company who leased it. And I'm trying to remember now what it was, but I think it was it was leased out and they painted it. And it was after the fact was then released to a company promoting investment in the UK or investment in Europe. It was really I need I would need to look up the story, but I definitely wrote a piece. I thought it was Nigel about. Farage's uh claim. Fifty million pounds a week we send to the EU, which we will no longer send to the EU. Can you guarantee that's gonna to go to the NHS? No, I can't, and I, and I would never have made that claim. Seventeen million people have voted for Lee. <laughs> I mean, just one of the many things wrong with that process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess, in a way, and you could probably say this too about the uh, U.S. presidential election of 2016, there were many uh, uh, things going on. Yeah. And you, I, I think that's part of the problem. There is so much going on. It's kind of hard to say, well, this one thing is bad and Facebook is bad and the Russians are bad. But it's it's kind of like all of the things we have to be worried about. And we have to confront and, yeah, we have to figure out the broader solution for a lot of I that. I mean, you could see the benefit can, to can Russia. Can we talk about the technology used to count the votes in America? Yep. Well, that's a mess, yeah. too. I mean, but there's oh no, God, but, but Dylan, there's no evidence that the, that there there were, vo there was, you know, election fraud in that regard was there well yeah. you, you know why there's no evidence because those voting machines <laughs> no paper do not trail. Have logs. <laughs> you wouldn't know even if that had happened know. also right. like you you don't need the evidence if you're gerrymandering districts and you're you know excluding people from voting and you're incepting people with false I like you don't need to even worry about that part if the the basic tenets of like how people are getting facts is broken yeah you know? and i guess in that regard you could say well russian influence is moot because there were so many other influences. Yet, I think everybody would agree we would prefer mm -hmm. that Russia not weigh in <laughs> on our process. And it yeah. is manifestly illegal for them to do so. So why don't we try to prevent that from happening in 2020? That seems no, like you that's, get not, political, a, yeah, but that but seems yeah. not like a nonpartisan <laughs> point of view. You I mean, think, Leo, but what side are they going to be yeah. on? I, I want to know what side they're going to be on before I decide. If well, it's maybe a good the thing. Russians this time, because they <laughs> yeah. didn't, you know, Donald didn't work out as well as they thought. Maybe they'll say, I don't know, you know, that uh, he worked Nate, out perfectly for them. <laughs> he's exactly what they want. Pete but. Buttigieg, he might be good for us too. You know, <laughs> let's uh, let's make him win this time. Yeah, but speaking of chaos... But that's what you yeah, don't want. You don't yeah. want Putin sitting in the Kremlin saying, who should win in 2020? Let me think. <laughs> that's what you don't want. It's more like, no, from a lot yeah. of the reporting and reading we've seen, is like, they wanted chaos. They tried many, well, many different that. things to introduce that, and they got it. So, you know, therefore, Trump was perfect. But you could definitely blame Silicon Valley for all the... for chaos, too. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good Lord. It's. I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I try not to get political on this show because we have viewers of every political uh, affiliation and I, I don't want to besmirch anybody yeah. for what they think uh, and how they voted. It's not that. It's, uh, it's just that we don't want companies like Facebook to be, provide an active avenue for malefactors. Of course, in the Ukraine, they've now elected... A comedian, <laughs> which seems like the best solution to the problem in general. Uh, wow. I mean, they're truth tellers, right? Usually. Yeah. You know what? Nobody's more honest than a comedian. It's funny because it's true. But you know what? The, the, there's a guy in, in Britain called Boris Johnson, and a lot of people talk about him being sort of next in line for the uh, sort of the, the premier position in, in government here. 
and he's a he's a former journalist. Yeah. You know, he used to be, he used to be a journalist. He was the mayor of London for a while. Everyone kind of when he was the mayor of London, everyone kind of joked about him. And he's one of these guys that said, you know, he's funny as long as he hasn't got any real power. And now there's this very real conversation about him potentially being in charge and everyone's sort of having that moment, scratching their heads, thinking like, oh, God, is this really going to happen? And um, yeah, you, sometimes you'd have yeah. to laugh. <laughs> I think you could say it would be safe to say that the Russians like uh, blondes with wild hairdos. That's one way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe not their natural hair colors. I don't know. Like there's a lot going on. There. Maybe, maybe that's all it is. You know, Putin has a thing for blondes. That's all. It's not, it's not malicious. It's not politics. It's not politics. He just likes a good comb over. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you gotta laugh, right? Uh, we'll continue on. <laughs> with with uh, more tech news we're going to we'll talk about Qualcomm Apple that's a big story that broke and uh, and then Intel kind of weighed in at the end that was kind of funny um Amazon and Google seem to be patching things up or are they and uh well there's a lot more to get to but first a word from our sponsor my good friends uh, David Friend, who is the CEO and founder of Carbonite, and his buddy Jeff Flowers, their technology guy. When they founded Carbonite, they came up with a really brilliant process, a unique process, they actually patented it, to lay data on disks, not sector by sector, as is done traditionally with all your disks, but sequentially. It turns out this was so much more efficient that they were able to create storage, for, and this was for Carbonite, that was cheaper and faster. Then they had a brilliant idea. They said, we should start a new company, a cloud storage company that takes advantage of this stuff. And Wasabi was born. Good name, too. Wasabi is hot cloud storage, data storage, moving to the cloud. Of course, the topic everybody is interested in. The ability to store efficiently and affordably data in the cloud is critical for businesses. Companies who want to put data in the cloud have many concerns. Among them, how secure will it be? How safe, how fast, how affordable. Wasabi has an answer that you're really going to like. Now, I know it's a new name to you, and people think Google, Amazon, Microsoft, but I want you to add a fourth name, Wasabi. Because Wasabi storage is 100% S3 compatible, but 600% faster and 80% less than S3. One of the reasons it's more affordable, no egress charges, none at all. So you can plan because you don't have to pay to get your data back. No charges for API requests. And Wasabi has something that is super cool. They call it immutable data. This is an answer to, to companies that have data in the cloud that gets corrupted or damaged or destroyed by ransomware or just, you know, goofball employees. You can designate data immutable. You could say this data cannot be changed and it'll be safe up there in the cloud on Wasabi. Wasabi is secure, in most cases more secure even than your local storage. It's HIPAA compliant, FINRA compliant, CJIS compliant. It's more affordable. It's more efficient. In fact, they have this Wasabi ball, which I love. Basically, it's a, it's a hard drive they, they send you. You can put petabytes of data on it, migrate it right up to Wasabi, just send it back to them. And with just one tier of service and free unlimited egress, your planning and budgeting gets a lot easier. So here's what you got to do. Add the name Wasabi to your list. Show the boss. Talk about the benefits. And I think the boss is going to do the smart thing. They're going to say, hey, you know, this Wasabi's pretty good. We should try it out. Good news. You can right now. If you go to Wasabi.com, click the free trial link. If you use Twit as the offer code, you'll get unlimited storage at Wasabi.com for a month. So you can really bang on it. You can upload a ton of stuff. And I think you'll see it's the best. Wasabi.com. If it's time to move to the cloud, do it right. Thank you, Wasabi, for your support. I appreciate it. And when you use that offer code TWIT, you're supporting us, so we appreciate it when you do that. Um, ransomware, what was I just saw Mondelez, the, the food company, the candy bar company. Ransomware hit them. $100 million lost. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't move inventory for three weeks. Oof. I'm writing a piece for Business Week as we speak about this that I think is coming out later this week. Um, around that and the problem with cyber insurance and public companies not paying out. Well, that's the other thing. Attack. It's an, it's deemed by some insurers as an act of war. Yeah. So it's not insurable. <laughs> 
It's because the Russians originated that ransomware. That that means it's an act of war, right? Well, it often, off. I mean, it, I think it's not in most cases, right? It's just some hacker in Bulgaria who wants to make some money. But often, you know, nation state hacking. There's a lot of it. Maybe it is. The Weather Channel <laughs> down for ninety day, ninety minutes. Turns out that was also ransomware. But the difference, the big difference, is they had backups. And maybe they're not quite as big an operation. So it took IT about 90 minutes to get uh, their systems back up. Actually, that's really fast work our, if you think about it. Our local public radio station, Leo, KQED, was, uh, they weren't off the air, but they lost pretty much their entire computer network due to um, ransomware a year and a half ago. Yeah. And it took them months to rebuild it. They were uh, doing stories with, you know, um, you know uh, they were printing things out through USB cables on an unwired printer, they were, you know, the phone system didn't work. So they, they were they were completely hammered by ransomware. And that, you know, I really hate it when a nonprofit gets hit like that. That's that's yeah. tragic. Uh, the cyber insurance thing is interesting because I think, Nate, I, I'm looking forward to your story because I think that uh, what insurance covers and does not cover um, is going to be increasingly important for big companies and what they, you know, what the insurance companies are in a very powerful position to be able to say, oh, you need to do X, Y, Z uh, in your, you know, in your setup in order to to be sufficiently protected that we will we will cover you if in the event that you do get hacked. Um, so, it, I mean, it's I, I, it's an area that I don't know a whole lot about yet, and um, yet I, I think it's becoming uh, increasingly important. So, Nate, do, they, do the that. insurance companies, uh, it seems to me this, this is not a brand new thing, that this happened before, but do they tell people ahead of time, oh, by the way, we're going to deem ransomware a, an act of war and we're not going to protect you? Uh, not not specifically, no. I mean, a lot of the problem is that some of the wording in these documents are, you know, they've been around for a long time. So the act of war uh, clause has been in there for a long time. Yeah, that's more like um, if a tank rolls over your building or a bomb goes off, right? It's not yeah. cyber warfare. And this is what this is what some of the uh, you know the lawyers for for Mondelez has been um, has been saying. And I, I was going through the court documents. I think they filed. I don't remember where they filed them now. I want to say Illinois. I think it might be. But um, anyway, the, the, you know, these documents basically said, look, it says act of war. But what is an act of war? You know, historically, right. and this has been uh, uh, traditional ballistics. You know, it's basically if it's not nukes and warheads, then it's not an act of war. And NATO, there was a guy from NATO um, that said that uh, that a ransomware attack could be used to trigger one of the articles in the NATO, you know, documents that basically says this is something that we would rally behind to protect one of the member states of NATO, i.e. it's an act of war, i.e. ransomware oh, would boy. be considered an act of war. Wow. So it's it's really, it's it's very, very messy. It's very interesting. Uh, and it's taken quite a lot of um, reading to, to to get my head around it too. But yeah, it's... Are it's any of these again. ransomware attacks? I think Petya was Petya a nation state? No. Petya. Uh, it was Petya facilitated was by an that... NSA tech, uh, a technology, but it was not written by a nation state. Right. I yeah, thought the was... assumption was not Petya is what you're talking about, right? The, the or one, not that, Petya that or not one. Petya. <laughs> it was Petya, not Petya, and and WannaCry. Yeah, and some of them were were using. Um, NSA technology. I forget which one it was, but there was one that hit um, some like power plants, I think, in one of the Eastern European countries. I'm not sure which one off the top of my head. Um, and one cry, a lot of people pegged to North Korea, like the US concluded it was it was North Korea that um, that had had sort of pushed that out. And I know the UK government as well blamed North Korea officially for that. Yeah. Um, you know, Evidence is because, mounting. And this comes from an article from a couple of years ago. That not Petya is not just overly aggressive ransomware, but a cyber weapon. Yeah, it was a nation state uh, attributed to a nation state actor. I, it was I'm, attributed I'm to yeah. uh, Shamoon, which has been targeting Saudi Arabia in the recent past. Um, so I don't know who Shamoon is. I guess that's another one of these uh, uh, malware groups like Fancy Bear. Wow. So that's interesting. I mean, I guess if, I mean, look, insurance companies from time immemorial have tried to figure out ways not to pay out. 
Uh, but boy, I mean, Mondelez lost a hundred million dollars. So, so they say, yeah, that you know, tens of thousands of, of uh, I think it's twenty thousand laptops. You know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff. And and yeah, they they want they want a hundred million out of um, who is it? This uh, Zurich is who the, yeah. who who is insuring them. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Wow. Uh, speaking of malware, uh, Marcus Hutchins has pled guilty. This was a story, just a fascinating uh, story. Um, Marcus was arrested after he attended DEF CON. Was it a, is it a, it was last year, right? It was more than a year ago. And uh, think, yeah. he was well known at the time because he was the guy who stopped WannaCry by figuring out what the server WannaCry phoned home to a server, and he stopped it by uh, re by registering the domain name and uh, taking that uh, that phone home server out of business. But it turns out he had a long history of um, writing malware, whether for for fun or profits, unclear. It it almost seems like they were exercises, including the Kronos malware, which has been used to steal banking information. Uh, it was a plea agreement. I wouldn't necessarily uh, assume that Marcus is saying, yeah, I'm a bad guy. I did it. Uh, I think more likely the Fed said, you're going to go to jail for a really long time if you don't uh, accept responsibility. Uh, although he pled guilty to two, two of ten counts. The other eight were dropped. But each of those two counts carries up to five years in prison. So he could still see, see some serious prison time. Usually, though, in an agreement like that, the implication is, well, by admitting that you did it and taking responsibility and apologizing, um, you could perhaps... This is one of those classic off. situations, I think, where I just, you know, I, I never want to be the guy that stands up to try and defend criminals uh, if, if, you know, charges are levied. But there is a lot to be said for hiring smart people, um, mm -hmm. maybe putting aside what they have done. I mean, obviously, there's a laundry list of things you would never put aside. But, you know, when it comes to things like computer hacking and fraud and, and stuff like that, like, do you want someone behind bars and banning them from computers? Or do you want to say, look, your penance is you're going to go and work for, you know, insert company here, and you're going to help figure out, you know, how to stop this kind of thing happening. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of evidence that he did this stuff when he was younger, I mean, he's a young guy anyway. And then as he got more mature, he turned he turned from black hat or maybe not even black hat, but gray hat to white hat hacking. And he's done <laughs> a lot of good as a malware researcher. Um, uh, he wrote, uh, as you may, on his blog, uh, malwaretech.com, as you may be aware, I've pled guilty to two charges related to writing malware in the years prior to my career in security. I regret these actions and accept full responsibility for my mistakes. Having grown up, I've since been using the same skills I misused, misused several years ago for construct, constructive purposes. I will continue to devote my time to keeping people safe from malware attacks. This is the beginning of what he will, what he and his attorneys will say in court, of course, trying to convince a judge that, you know, I'd be mm -hmm. exactly as you say, Nate, I'd be more useful out of jail fighting malware. Yeah, I yeah. think governments would want to keep these folks around, too, who actually know how to help prevent similar attacks within you know their country. And, and I think a lot of people felt a bad... Marcus had a good reputation when he was arrested. A lot of people had a bad taste in their mouth. He was arrested at the airport as he was leaving the United States. Uh, there was some, you know, in 2017, uh, there was some real concern among security researchers that it was going to be risky to come to the United States uh, because you might be arrested on your way in or your way out. And, it's, and a lot of conferences no longer come to the U.S. for that reason. Unfortunately, the feds have a long history of coming down really hard on right. uh, people who commit, you know, cybersecurity crimes uh, who are otherwise, you know, fairly innocuous or not all that harmful and would be quite useful, um, you know, as white hat hackers. Right. Um, to, you know, they have a tendency to want to make an example of people and lean on him really yeah. hard he was a teenager and i think that he there's no evidence he used chronos himself to any ill effect but he did release it perhaps he sold it in which case yeah he deserves the punishment um anyway that's an update we've been covering that since it happened in 2017 wow it's been a long time apple and qualcomm have uh, buried the hatchet 
kind of a shock. This came yeah, out. What a whirlwind of news. I know. I know. I mean, like Monday, the trial began. Multi-billion dollar trial. This had been an ongoing battle. Apple owed Qualcomm billions. Qualcomm was withholding technology. Uh, they actually impaneled a jury. They had our opening arguments. And then the very next day, it's over. We, and, of course, we don't know what the settlement was, although... Uh, apparently, Apple gave Qualcomm some amount of money. We don't know how much. And Qualcomm, in its part, uh, has reached a six-year license agreement with Apple. They're going to buy their chips for six years with an option of two years to extend. Now, I have lots of theories about why this happened. One of them <laughs> is fueled by the fact that almost immediately after, <laughs> Intel said, oh, thank God we don't have to make 5G phones. We're out. We're out. <laughs> oh, we're out of the business. Oh, what a relief. Apple was turning totally, to totally Intel. believe in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Apple was using Intel modems, you know, this year and, and, and was slowly phasing out Qualcomm chips, partly because Qualcomm wouldn't give them the chips. Apple's contention in public was, oh, those are crappy chips anyway. Although one of the things Apple admitted to doing and the Qualcomm sued him for is slowing down Qualcomm radios uh, on some iPhones so they wouldn't be any faster than the Intel radios and the other iPhones. <laughs> We got to make it fair. Oh man! <laughs> so this is this is great news for Apple and Qualcomm, I guess, because it means you know the, the road to the five G iPhone, be it next year or twenty twenty one, is is kind of set. But I, this is another big loss for Intel. And I feel like we're not talking about that enough too, because a couple of years ago, they felt really burned by missing out on mobile CPUs and all of that. And I had talked to some Intel executives, and they were making a big play for modems. And they made it. They had. They got it into the iPhones. Uh, I I don't know what this means for Intel's like mobile chip business in general. If they you can't even do modems anymore. Yeah, I mean it's bad for Intel. I mean I think the other yeah. reason Apple said let's not continue this is discovery is always painful, and Apple's learned this in their long <laughs> battle with Samsung. And a lot of times things that Apple would like to keep secret, uh, that any company would like to keep secret, leak out in discovery, including that email from Apple saying. Oh, these Qualcomm modems, they're the best. <laughs> Even though Apple publicly is saying, oh, they're terrible. Uh, that you was know, Tim Cook was Tim Cook was gonna have to testify too. Yeah, I'm not sure good. they didn't want to put him on the stand and no. have him have him be a witness. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's a little it, in fact Qualcomm's stock price went up almost twenty percent. Apple's went up a little bit, mostly because Qualcomm was under a lot of uh, you know, the weight of this was a big depressant to its stock price but now that it's resolved qualcomm can go ahead and sell chips to apple apple i'm sure has thousands of engineers as we speak working long hours even on easter trying to come up with a 5g modem for an iphone um, but that's not going to be they don't have to worry for six years anyway I'm also a little bummed about this because Qualcomm basically has a stranglehold on this market. You know, a little a little competition is always better. It makes everybody better. Um, I, I guess we'll see what will happen now. If Intel can't even compete, who can? So well, I have a question. Yeah. What, mm -hmm. which, came, which came first? Was it Intel saying it was going to pull out or was it the Apple Qualcomm settlement? No, the settlement so, happened and the then settlement. within hours, Intel said, we're out. But the lawyers talk behind the scenes before yeah. either of those two things happen. So I'm just curious, like, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, was that the order that things took place? Or did something oh. happen? Oh, so to maybe, fuel that? you're right. Maybe Intel yeah. went to, maybe Intel went to Apple and said, dudes, <laughs> this 5G modem thing is not working. We're not going to have it for you or we can't do it. Yeah, that that's what I wonder. That I'm sure, you no, I think it's exactly what happened. You Yep. You know, even Intel stock went up after this announcement, so <laughs> that might be a sign of... You're going to focus on making better processors for uh, desktops. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What do you think Intel's future is? It's, uh, well, so they had announced last year that they, first of all, they stole the head uh, graphics guy from AMD. So right. he's over the guy who, like, revamped all the Radeon cards. Um He's now over at Intel creating like a discrete graphics thing. They say their in their integrated graphics are going to be better. We're waiting to hear about more details about their ninth generation mobile chips. Like they're you know they're making a lot of progress, but I do feel like outside of this core PC laptop desktop market, 
Intel doesn't have that much going on. So it, it is kind of funny to see them run away from modem so quickly. And not that it's going to really hurt Intel, but Apple is clearly on a path to abandon Intel chips entirely, not just in Oof. its iPhones, yeah. but on its desktop and laptop computers. I don't know if that's a big deal for Intel. It's mm -hmm. embarrassing. <laughs> I think, well, Apple's also racing to give us the lowest spec things we can, uh, that they can call a MacBook, right? <laughs> the, that new MacBook Air is basically running it's on so like... so depressing. It, oh it, my it is, God. It, it, like the iPad Pro, like eventually saying, the iPad Pro and the MacBook is going to convert. What, yeah. They're saying, what's the slowest computer people will actually yeah. buy? I guess that's the iPad Pro, right? Like the iPad Pro is their vision for where no, they No, the iPad Pro is fast. Go. The 12X fast. in there is like desktop class. It's really good. It it's, is of insane. course, hampered by 10-year-old software. By iOS, yeah. iOS is, a, you know, I mean, it hasn't changed much in years. But that may change. iOS 13 mm -hmm. is rumored to be a, a redesign for iPad, particularly. So I'm going to yeah. I'm going to tell you something that is that is really shocking to me to realize, right? So I when the when the most recent MacBook generations, the the, the sort of late 2018 ones were released, I went out and I bought one 15 inch top spec, and then in November I think it was the new iPad Pro was announced. I went out and I bought one of those, the 11 inch, um, and I realized a few weeks ago that I've basically not used that MacBook Pro since the iPad since I got the iPad Pro. And I and I'm now selling the MacBook Pro because Whoa. I don't need it. I don't need it. You know, what I, do you I, chiefly is you use it for music? What do you what do you you don't everything. write your articles on it, do you? I, I do. Yeah, I write my articles on it. I wow. so my the podcast that I do outside of Bloomberg, I edit now um on the iPad. I upload it from the iPad. I do wow. the show notes on the iPad. Wow. Um you know, I've done video editing when I went to Mobile World Congress at the end of uh, in February or was it beginning of March earlier this year. It was the first time in 13 years of covering tech conferences that I didn't take a laptop. It's not that I took one and left it in the hotel. I didn't even take one with me because I did everything on that iPad, video editing, photo editing, um, you know, all my writing, all my uploads. Um, absolutely everything I did on the iPad Pro. And the only thing now for me holding it back is the fact that you, you, there is no real file system. So you can't plug in a USB drive and pull files off it. You know, you have to go around that. But apart from that, it really has got to the point where I don't need my MacBook Pro anymore. And I'm selling it. It also has a better keyboard than the MacBook Pro. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, yeah. A, a clay hey, tablet has a better keyboard works. than the MacBook Pro. <laughs> That's not saying it's, a whole lot. I, I love that. I love that keyboard. But I mean, even even little things like, you know, plugging plugging a microphone in by USB-C straight into the Isn't iPad Pro. Isn't that nice? Pro. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it works fantastically well. It's it, it's really quite amazing. So, yeah, I think the, the power in that thing is 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 excellent. You know, it's got a lot more efficient as well. The fact you can have two apps running side by side, you can have a third app overlaid over the top of that. You can have video if you need running picture in picture and you can still have stuff running in the background like the 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 power in that thing is really quite amazing. So, I think um it, I mean iOS generally needs an overhaul if it's going to compete more broadly I think with with desktops, but it's it's definitely got to a point where yeah, I don't I don't need that MacBook Pro. I need my desktop, definitely. I still need my desktop for my main work. Ah, but when it comes oh, to Oh, I get it. So That's you, the key. Yeah. I get it. You still have a desktop. You're just not using a, a laptop. I get it. Okay. But yeah, so everything on the go. I, I uh, yeah, I is now it, what what was previously MacBook Pro for the last ten years or whatever is now is now. Well, I'd love Pro. to say that. Wait, I so bought an i nine MacBook Pro as well and and gave it to my son. I don't use it, but that was more because I couldn't bear the keyboard. But <laughs> Nate, when you say I, I often feel like when I'm using iOS, I'm struggling harder than I should. Like I can get it to do stuff, but it's like it's harder to do stuff. You don't feel that way? No, I I really don't. I mean, the one thing that I use as well is um, I have a remote desktop app that I use. So on the oh. very rare occasion oh. that I need to, <laughs> I can remote into a desktop, but it's, it's so, so, so rare. And, and a lot of the time it is only because I need something that's like specific to, you know, to work or to Bloomberg or something like that. Um, and, and, and that's it, but it's, it's, it's so close. It is so close. And I mean, the fact that I, I can, for me, it's the podcasting side of things, right? It's the fact that I can I can record all that stuff on there. I can do my multi-track editing on there, all the effects. Same with video, and I can do it all on the on the iPad. 
is is just amazing. Like if you listen to the show, you wouldn't be able to tell whether one was edited in Logic and one was edited on on Ferrite, which is what I use on the iPad. It's really you, it's really quite amazing. You said there's no real file system though. So my interpretation of that, and tell me if this is right, is that if you were working with other people who had uh, you know, you were sending a lot of files around or collaborating on PowerPoints or Word documents instead of uh, cloud-based stuff, that might be a problem, right? No, you can still do that. Um, what I mean with file system is, you know, on a Mac or on a PC, if you've got files on a hard drive, you just plug it in by USB and copy stuff over. You can't plug a hard drive into an iPad and just copy files. You've got, you've got, if you download it from the web or you have some FTP right. app or whatever, you can still get those files onto it. It's no problem. Well, um, or you, it them. you have to do it from an application. So it requires that the mm -hmm. application can see those files and can open them. But if they yeah. can, then you can use Dropbox. So your PowerPoint example, you could Dropbox a PowerPoint and somebody else could open yes. it. But, yeah. uh, but, but you, you can, can only do it from okay PowerPoint. The there's, no, there's no independent way to do it. You have to do it mm -hmm. from within the app. And that's a security and convenience yeah. a dumbing down of the app i always feel like when i'm using the ipad i always feel like i don't know like a raptor like my my <laughs> elbows are, and i can i can only it's like so, it's not fully constraining but it's just not completely like just I can, enough yeah just you enough. want to be free like a bird I want to you want to fly, fly. Yeah, but you know, there's you. something, there's something like, there's something so liberating. Like, I'm, I'm really, really big up, and and every year I get more so, on the, on the sort of the mental health impacts of technology. Oh and one of the God, things I yes. think I really like about about the iPad specifically is that it's not trying to be a desktop where I've got a million windows open, I've got three displays, everything's blinking at me. Like, there's that, there's that ability to slightly control better what is in front of me. It's it's the same argument for why people like a Kindle for reading instead of an iPad. They don't want notifications popping up. They can just focus on a book. And I think that that similar is true when it comes to the iPad. And I've just got a better ability to control what's shouting at me from a screen, which then helps me be more productive, less stressed and and things like that. It also helps that that is one of the most beautiful gadgets around right now. That thing looks amazing. The only really issues we're pointing to is like iOS not being up to snuff. Yeah, the right. hardware is stunning. Yeah, yeah. I usually say I, my my tagline is this is a computer from the future running an OS from the past, mm -hmm. and it's just a mismatch. Yeah. And Apple could totally fix that, but I think they're reluctant to go too far because a they want to keep it simple. Probably the, that's their most important rationale, and b they're not quite ready to kill Macintosh. I don't think they want to kill Mac OS. This is the thing. Like, yeah, I remember there was that great quote that Steve Jobs gave. I, it probably was about the iPad, which is, you know, no one takes a truck to the shop and there's a need for trucks and there's a need for little nimble, you know, single seater self-driving electric vehicles that just takes you to the store and back. Um, and I kind of think that there's still a need for that. Definitely. Like I still, I wouldn't, I'm not going to give up my desktop right now and I can't see why I would get rid of my desktop. I've got a 34 inch ultra wide monitor that you can't see hooked up on the left. I've got this big iMac sitting in front of me on the right. Like I need that for, you know, many types of work application, but I don't need it all the time. And a lot of the time mm -hmm. I just need, I need everything that's just in front of me. I can take it wherever I go. And that's where the iPad is. And it's really getting there. It's not for everyone, but it's definitely got to that point for me. Okay. <laughs> we'll see iOS 13, which will, I'm sure learn a lot more about uh, in June at WWDC, Apple's developers conference. And of course, it will come out with a new uh, iPhone in September, but supposedly has a lot more multitasking capability, a lot of stuff that will make the iPad um, a more usable computer. Honestly, though, I don't see that one thing that I agree with you, we really need, Nate, which is the ability to access files directly. Over, mm -hmm. over the, yeah. the fact that they put a Type C on it was really wonderful. I mean, what they call it Pro, and it's lacking the one feature that I would argue <laughs> that every needs. single yeah. Pro user needs. It's a joy without... to edit photos with, except <laughs> you have to import photos <laughs> into Photos first, yeah. and then import it from Photos. This is where the lack of the file system really hurts. Then import it from Apple's Photos yeah. into Lightroom or whatever you're using. It is That's funny cool. how every Apple device now is becoming like this weird Twilight Zone conclusion. It's like, oh, you have the most beautiful tablet in the world, but you, you can't really edit <laughs> files with it. <laughs> <laughs> Submitted for your approval. A man I was trapped just trying to edit some files. In the iOS zone. <laughs> All 
right, we're going to take a little break. There's a lot more to talk about, including Apple uh, at News Plus. I'd like to get your impression because people who use Texture are about to go without. And that's uh, that was a, a magazine app I really uh, like. But first, we did make a little, uh, I think we made a little feature film. <laughs> we're going to submit it to the Venice Film Festival. Uh, all about this week on Twit. Previously on Twit. On April 17th, 2005, we did the very first episode of what was at the time called The Revenge of the Screensavers, right? And it went so well, so many people uh -oh, listened that um, I chased them all away. And this is, in a nutshell, the story of Twit. <laughs> All about Android. People got their hands on the Samsung Galaxy Fold, and you were one of them, correct? You mean this one? Oh, he oh, has it. Oh, he has it, it is, in everyone. person. My first yeah. question is, what does the Fold feel like? Do you yes, feel it creaking? Yes. How does this sound? <laughs> this week in Enterprise Tech. I'm buying it. This story that we're talking about today calls out a well-known food brand. Well, this company was struck by the not Petya cyber strike in 2017. They were blocked by the insurance company who used a loophole, their war exclusion clause, which protects the insurer from costs related to the damage from war. In this case, cyber war. And I think what this will begin is a series of negotiations about what precisely cyber warfare looks like. Words matter. And the use of one word over another has consequences in the real world, some of which can cost real money. Twit. For help with the technology addiction problem, call 1-800-TWIT. <laughs> and then the phone will say, yeah, <laughs> and you have some more numbers for me? Our show today brought to you by Stamps.com. We, uh, we don't go to the post office here at Twit. No, no, no. We're much more modern than that. We buy and print all our postage right here from our desks with our computers. No, I'm not talking a postage meter. That's even worse. No, no. We use stamps.com. See, I can buy postage. I could print postage. In fact, when the rates went up, man, it was awesome. We were ready. We had we had stamps. We print them on demand. You could print right on an envelope. Stamps.com will automatically fill in the return address, will automatically take the addresses of the people you're mailing to from your contact list. Or, you know, if you're an Etsy buyer or seller, rather, an eBay, uh, Amazon seller, it'll take it right off the website. Saves you a lot of time. Fill out all the forms you need for uh, international mail, for uh, certified mail. So you spend less time, you get it, and it, by the way, it looks so much more professional. When you print on an envelope, you get your company logo, your return address. It's so gorgeous. Even the that little uh, barcode that the post office likes for fast routing to make sure your mail really gets to where it's going. Plus, you get discounts you can't get at the post office. So when the price went up, when we were printing out new stamps, we got five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail because we use stamps.com. I mean, that's awesome. Not to mention... It's a fraction of the cost of a postage meter. Stamps.com is a no-brainer. It'll save you time. It'll save you money. It makes you look more professional. Over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. That's what we use. We love it so much. You also, I'm going to show you how you can get a USB scale so you'll always have exactly the right postage. It just sends it right into the software. Uh, you could print postage for any letter, but also any package, any class of mail. Stamps.com will even suggest more affordable clay will say is that a book we could do media mail you want to do media mail it is amazing right now you can enjoy the stamps.com service with a great offer we have for you four week trial plus free postage yeah free postage and a digital scale with no long-term commitment you see that click the microphone enter the code twit this is a secret a hundred and ten dollar bonus offer including it's 55 dollars worth of postage coupons I just, I this is the deal you want. Go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter twit. Stamps.com. It is great. I love the post office, but you should only go to the post office because you want to visit your postal carrier. You, you, know, you just want to see it. You know, it's a nice place. <laughs> if you're mailing something, just do it from your desk with stamps.com. Uh, let's see. Where were we going? I forgot what I said I wanted to talk about. There's also all sorts of news. Let's do some more Apple uh, news. Oh, yeah. We were talking about uh, texture. I can't believe I'm going to quote the New York Post here. <laughs> but they have a media column. It's pretty good. Ke uh, Keith Kelly. Apple to shutter texture for news app 
leave Android users out of luck. May 28th, if you've been subscribing to Texture, and I know a lot of you do because they were an advertiser for a long time, uh, Apple's going to shut down those 240,000 subscribers. If you're on iOS, you can just move to News Plus, uh, which is pretty much exactly what Texture was. Yeah. Uh, or if you're on Android, is there are Android? There are other choices, I think, but I don't think they have the same number of magazines. No, and Texture was the best. Like so many companies have tried this whole subscription magazine thing, and there's a reason Apple bought Texture, and there's a reason they built a whole service around it. It really was the best. Yeah. Do you like Apple News Plus? It's fine. Like I, I signed up for the free trial, and actually, as we were doing this conversation, I had to remind myself to go cancel it because <laughs> it's fine. It's perfectly fine, but I don't I don't no, really need I'm it. It's nice it to have too. these magazine articles once in yeah. a while. I only really read magazines because I like the feel and I wanna sit down with that long form stuff. I don't it's on the web. If it's if a magazine article's on the web, I'll read it there. I don't need this whole other app to deal with that. I feel the same way. And then the magazines that I really do want to support, note support as opposed to read, mm -hmm. uh I, like the New Yorker and the Atlantic, I will subscribe i'll use their apps and subscribe <laughs> does anybody actually read the new yorker same I, the I, new yorker I, app is great i don't read it but boy is it great you can go right to the cartoons <laughs> you like to say you subscribe I, and that you know the cartoon no, but you, you know don't what? actually read especially the new yorker especially in our business these days they're doing really good tech tech coverage they do they have good stuff and so especially in our business i feel like there is an article by ken alletta or somebody like that that i have to read at least once a month there's a law and they're long so there's a long form article I want to read in the New Yorker. Atlantic is the same thing. I feel like there's, a, especially for politics coverage, Atlantic and the New Yorker. I got, I have to have those, and then I pay for the New York Times, which is not on News Plus, and I pay for the Wall Street Journal, which is. You know who the big beneficiary of News Plus is, in my opinion, is the Los Angeles Times. It's a chance for that. That's one of the things you get with a News Plus subscription, and it's mm. a real chance for them to get a national profile. So two things that stand out here. Um, the first is that I see absolutely no reason why Apple won't release News Plus for Android. If you look yeah. at everything that it's doing recently, it's all about services, right? Apple needs services for its future. You know, they've announced Apple TV that's going to be on Samsung televisions. They've got Apple Music on Android. They're going to have News Plus on Android, because why would you shut out hundreds of millions of potential subscribers to your to your services uh, product? So it's going to happen. There's no doubt in my mind that it's going to happen. And then the second thing is more of a rant, which is <laughs> that one of the main reasons why I like using Apple News as an app, that is, is because I have never hated browsing the web more than I do today. It has True got that. to the point. It has got to the well, point, that's a good I point. swear to yeah. you, that the ads on websites are the least annoying thing on a website, particularly in Europe. And this is honestly, this is more so than in the US, because in Europe, you have the cookies pop up that's asking you on. No, every we get that, too. Yeah, That's what that really makes me mad. Mm -hmm. It's some <laughs> stupid European law, but we get it too. <laughs> okay, imagine that. But on top of that, you then have a pop-up that says, we value your privacy. Click here to accept all these terms. On every website you go uh, we to, don't have on to... every device that you're That's on. That's ridiculous. And then that's on top of your, on the ads, that's on top but of... You, subscribe but to blame GDPR. Like blame the EU parliament for that. I do. Yeah. I blame it all. <laughs> but you don't get any of that. But you don't get any of that when you are in um, in a news app like Apple News, oh, and I think is, and that's this that's is why a I perfect like example of regulation. I think GDPR is is a, on the on the balance of great mm -hmm. benefit, but this is a perfect example of where sometimes regulation just goes badly wrong. That cookies banner does nothing but annoy. It doesn't. Yep. It, in fact, it has the opposite mm -hmm. impact. It just makes people go, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't yep. want to read that. Um, yep. It's just like clicking yes or accept on uh, terms and conditions or a privacy policy. It's just about as meaningful. You wrote, Nate, about the uh, browser ballot. Microsoft famously was required, required to do that uh, by the EU. Now Google is going to do that. Uh, yep. wh where are they doing that, though? They are doing that in, in, in Europe. So, um, But on what, but where? I mean, on Android? Where do you get that? On, on, on Android. So, so if Android, I get a brand new Android phone, one of the first things I'm going to do is have to choose which browser? 
We don't know exactly how. I mean, it was meant to be rolling out, I think, on... It was Thursday, right? I think on Thursday... There this was, is uh, res software in update. response to the EC's 4.3 billion euro fine. Yeah, well, they wanted to avoid further antitrust fines. Right. You know, the, the, the EU had basically said, look, you can't use Android to strong arm people into using Chrome and into using Google Search. So Google agreed that it would make some changes to make it less apparent that it was strong arming people into using Chrome and Android. <laughs> and one of the ways that they've done that is to <laughs> <Nicely> follow put. <laughs> is to textbook follow what Microsoft did with right. Internet Explorer, which is when you when you fire up uh, you fire up the Play Store, this is all after a software update. You fire up the Play Store and you're asked um, do you want to change your search engine from Google to something else? And do you want to change, do you want to install another browser? Um, and there are some key differences that I think need to be worked out. Like, I don't think it's saying, do you want to install this, remove Chrome and set the new one as your default? It's like, <clears throat> look, there are some other browsers available. Maybe you want to install them and that's fine. So that's what they're doing. And it's very similar to what Microsoft did. But the difference, and that was what, 10 years ago in 2009? This is, this is the f yeah. infamous Windows browser ballot. Yeah, and exactly. these were offered in random order, so you might get as your very first choice, <laughs> say, Sleep Near. The that solved everything. <laughs> yeah. This the was difference, user friendly. The difference now, the difference now that's so fascinating is that at the time, you know, the, the legislation had come too late. IE was already on the down, uh, you know, falling down because of I think Firefox had overtaken it in Europe at the time that that settlement was reached. Um, whereas at the moment. Chrome in, so in worldwide figures, Chrome specifically on Android has close to 90% uh, of the market. You know, IE did not have 90% of the market right. at the time that right. they, they settled with the EU. Right. So um, a lot of people said, well, the browser choice screen for Windows didn't really affect IE because it was doomed anyway. On this occasion, I'm very, I'm going to be very interested to see how it pans out because I don't know why you would switch from Chrome to something else or why you would switch from Google to, to Bing or Doug. Well, I know that one a bit better, actually. I don't know why you'd leave Chrome. But um, whether it'll make a difference, I, I don't know. But but I think it will be more interesting to see this versus the uh, the Windows equivalent. It's really interesting to see how these things have kind of turned around, too, because on Windows 10, now uh, Edge is your default. It's pre-installed. If you go to download Chrome, at least in the U.S., it's like, you sure you want to do that? Edge is pretty great. <laughs> Like, you don't want this other browser on your system. But I guess that's okay, legally at this point. I, switching my search engine is one of the first things I always do on a new phone. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel the need to switch to a different browser than Chrome, that's for sure. I mean, th I think Chrome at the time that it came out, there were some really great um, reasons to use Chrome. I mean, say, actually more so even with Firefox. I mean, when Firefox came out, no one was used to this concept of add-ons and tabbed browsing and things like that. So when that came out, there was this sudden, like, just crazy excitement that there was a different way to browse the web and different way to do things on do things online. And that was great. And then Firefox got very sluggish and slow and Chrome came along and it was just slick and fast and everything was tied into Google. And, and again, that really helped, I think, sort of pick up the pace and get people excited about browsers again. But on on Chrome on Android, I don't know what you would want to add or change. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. on on iOS, you have to use Safari as the default browser. Period. On on Android, you can take off Chrome. You can put anything you want on it if you care. And mm -hmm. I would submit that most users, maybe not Chrome, but most users want the Google apps. And this has nothing to do with the fact that Android's laden with Google apps. So I don't. I, I, this seems a lot like the Windows browser ballot issue all over again. Yeah. And I think you, you, you get a point of fatigue at some point where users just go, why are they screwing with us? I just want to use my phone, please. It's another damn pop-up that another, I have to click on. It is. It's just another pop-up. Oh, I, 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 I wish, by the way, we need to make illegal all those, the pop-ups. Uh, can, can this website notify you for anything? Why would I want notifications oh, from a website? Oh, that drives me Why? freaking nuts. Or or location alerts, like let this website track your location when you're not even like a map thing. I don't know what's happened to the modern web. but it's You kind can, of I believe, go into Chrome or whatever browser you use and say, please, yeah. nobody should get, nobody should get nobody. notifications. Nobody. Just zero. Don't ask me. <laughs> 
I uh, just I run into I run new computers enough. That I know me this too. It's constantly a problem. Yeah. And it's like this is these all these. Po so I agree with you, Nate. And yet it's a shame because the open web is the best alternative to these silos, mm -hmm. these these uh, walled gardens, these gated communities, or things like the News Plus app. I I don't think uh, it's a good thing for content to be aggregated to be disaggregated really from their yep. original source and stuck in an app is not good for for anybody um well i think it's quite clear too why there's so much why the web experience is so crummy these days and why there are so many pop-ups like that saying you know can we alert you or um you know, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, those newsletter pop-ups that show up, you know, some random number of seconds after you've started getting into reading <sighs> the oh, thing, just that. when you're really yeah. engaged. Like, but the reason that that's happening is that these, you know, on publisher, you know, news sites and magazines and publishers of any kind, they're just desperate to make money any way they can because so much of the value has been sucked out yeah, of the advertising right. ecosystem by the bigger players, yeah. by Go the Google and the Facebook. So they have to do this. They have to throw a bunch of pop-ups at you because, you know, they need to wring out any money that they can from the system. And that's all that's left. It makes me sad and because our shows have basically turned into when good tech goes wrong. And, <laughs> and, and the promise, the great promise and excitement over tech the internet, uh, all these interesting gadgets and computers uh, of the 90s has, has been replaced by this sad dystopia that we're living Only in. Only for the moment. Only for the yeah. moment. Do you think it's going to pass? Yeah, of course it'll pass. It's it's brilliant. Like people want this to be great, and as long as people want it to be great, then new things yeah. will come along. Good. You know, I think you look at the success of something like Twitter. You know, or is it Blogger was a guy who did it before. You know, it was successful because of what he didn't have. You know, that was the reason that Twitter was so good, because it, it didn't have the mess of crap that Facebook's got. And people are yes. like, yeah, this is great. It's no, super simple. Right. So it's what you leave out that becomes what's good about that pr that product. And I think the same will happen for the web in some form. Um, mm -hmm. It'll it'll just take a little bit of time. Um, you know, I, I had another point to make, and it's gone out of my head because <laughs> it's half past 12, and I can't remember what it was. I'm sure it was fascinating. <laughs> well, Game of Thrones starts pretty soon, so don't worry. This will be coming over. Soon. You're but Leo, to your point, like I think we're so used to tech being counterculture too, right? Like I wired back in the day, like that was yeah. that was everything. Right. But you were the rebels. Right. And now tech is one. Tech is tech is everything. That sucks, tech man. Tech is controlling everything, and it's not it's not great. But you know, we we can move on to the next stage where we make it better. We want to be losers again. <laughs> <laughs> Too much winning. I can't take all this winning. <laughs> Actually, I thought when I thought Dylan, when you were going to say, uh, you know, there's one thing wrong. It really the thing wrong is ad tech. But actually, yeah. that's not because now it's government pop ups too. It's privacy pop ups. It's alerts. It, it, yeah. You, and then the it's, ad, the it's, ad it's model. I just, both, yeah. the, I just remembered the point that I was going to make, um, which I'm just going to throw out really quickly, uh, which is. The nature of ads has changed to the point that the websites are now having to move to these affiliate models where oh, they're essentially linking. Nightmare. Yes, they're linking through to products and that becomes the way that they're making their money because the ad business has been sucked up by Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. And also the ad business also full of lies. So that, that's a whole thing. Like everything <laughs> is falling apart. Great. <laughs> yeah. Could you get me, John, those crap products that are that you cleaned up that are on the against the wall there's two things this was i went to i can't remember it was tech crime it was something like good site that i went to and uh and this i see this more and more and you're at, you nailed it nate because more and more sites are turning to basically either if if it's not native content which is horrible mm -hmm. which is an ad posing as actual content to ads for affiliate products and and they're really just blatant hucksterism they're not and so I, I was fooled. I, I was on a site that I, used to be a good site. I don't know what it was. Yeah, those. And it said, hey, boy, you got to take advantage of this deal. You can get a, a, a Sonic electric toothbrush uh, for like twenty nine ninety five. And I thought, oh, that's great. Then I went and I ordered it. And it's, it's a fake, like, Chinese knockoff of an electric <laughs> toothbrush from smilebrightstore.com. Obviously, it was an affiliate link for something terrible i ordered two which was stupid but the good news is well i was going to give one away i thought this is a, this is too good a deal that's a hundred dollar toothbrush and then the good news is instead of sending me a toothbrush they sent me a face brush for the second one 
which isn't, but it, it is not, and it is from mylifemyshop.com. The, but they're both in this fake mint color. I this is I've not even opened these because they're clearly just going to explode in my hand the minute I plug them in. It drove me nuts. And that was we've, used we to, to be a site. Stop. We have to put a stop to your late night shopping, Leo. I think that's it. Well, Just that's like, the other thing I want to point out. Ads, no more. Leo, ads do work. Leo, I had to stop. I kind of I, I love this about you, Leo. You're like, I have no idea what this is, but it looks like a great deal. <laughs> I'll take like two. I'll take two. No, I'll buy a I, folding phone. It yeah. said, it two. said, it said, it said on it, uh, oh, and it has a UV sanitizing system. It said something like Sonic toothbrush, but it said, it. yeah, it does. The Smile Bright Store Platinum Sonic Toothbrush, but it's in lowercase s. That's where I went wrong. <laughs> <sighs> but, you know, I did have to stop doing Instagram, not because I didn't like Instagram. I don't. I don't like Facebook. But but more because I kept buying stuff on it. Oh, man. Those, those, those ads, ads work. Those ads are dangerous. Those yeah. ads work. So it's possible to make ads that work. I'd like to think our ads work. You know, it's not working. This is a great article in the New York Times. Facebook, apparently, I didn't know this. Facebook uh, created something called Summit Learning, which was a, a, a internet learning curriculum promoting an educational approach called personalized learning, which uses online tools to customize ev education. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan, their foundation, funded it. It was developed by... Five Facebook engineers, Mark said, go work on this. It's been rolled out in a number of towns, uh, particularly towns, and this was the great high you know, goal of all of this, towns where the under, schools were underfunded and the test scores were going down. Under the program, students spend much of the day on their laptops, go online for lessons, plans, and quizzes, which they complete at their own pace. Teachers assist students with the work, hold mentoring sessions, lead special products. The system is free to schools. The laptops are bought separately. This sounds great, right? What could... This is brilliant. So almost everywhere Summit Learning is, people are rebelling. Students are, are striking. According to the New York Times this Sunday, the students started coming home with headaches and ham cramps. Some said they felt more anxious. One child began having a recurrence of seizures. Another asked to bring her dad's hunting earmuffs to class to block out classmates because work was now done largely alone. Summit's response is, well, these people had just have an old-fashioned nostalgia for the old <laughs> form of education. <laughs> but there is a mounting... Well, we according... didn't have headaches. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, there were no headaches. There is a mount, according to the Times, a mounting nationwide opposition to Summit. It's now in 380 schools used by 74,000 students. In Brooklyn, high school students walked out in November after their schools started using Summit. In Indiana, Pennsylvania, 70% of students wanted Summit dropped or made optional. Wait, uh, just, just, just to be clear, the idea is that this is all like screen learning, not yes. like your teacher doing stuff. You're on screen, baby. Ugh. Here's a Here's a sign. That popped up in a neighborhood. Stomachs are churning with Summit Learning. <laughs> <laughs> they can't do anything wow. right. Man. Well, but it also, sh it's really a perfect example of Facebook, of not Facebook, Silicon Valley's mm -hmm. kind of blind belief that technology can fix everything. Yes. Yeah. And that this is going to go great. And this is a great way. And look, I don't, I think that their motives are pure. That it's nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, they 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 sent it to you know school districts that were underfunded where kids weren't doing well, but it but it, it seems to have made the children sick. <laughs> That's so bad. That's just like what 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 are they doing? What yeah. are they doing wrong? Oh my god! And by the way, programs like this you usually get like somebody who's familiar with like education programming, like how to build a system like this, and who knows if they even managed to do that because. I can't imagine somebody who studied kids and education would be like, let's just have them stare at screens all day yeah. rather than engage with a human being. Well, and I, and I, uh, right. I've, uh, you know, I've been on the board of a, of a private school and, and I, and they, one of the reasons they want me on the board is said, well, you're a technologist. You can help us be more tech, technology forward. And I always said, no, you don't want more technology. You want less technology. Yeah. You've got great teachers. It's the personal relationship. The teachers offer the students 
that's most important. And by the way, if you teach people how to use Microsoft Word, by the time they get out of college, it won't be Microsoft Word. <laughs> so you shouldn't teach them technical skills. You probably shouldn't even teach them coding. You should teach them things like critical thinking, you know, deep, mm -hmm. you know, things that have been around for hundreds of years that are important. And, and they'll learn the technology. I'm not worried about kids and technology. They're going to learn the technology. Look, this is Wellington, Kansas, written on the storefront. Don't plummet with Summit. No proof of success. Summit equals summer school. Stop the lies. <laughs> wow. I mean, there's wow. like this grassroots hatred of this thing. I love that it's, it's the kids like rebelling against it too, which is, I think is powerful. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I also think it's well, kind of funny that... Summit says, oh, that's just nostalgia for the old way of learning. <laughs> just just get used to the seizures. Yeah. <laughs> yes, seizures. Jeez. It was causing seizures in one child. Because she was supposed to, you know, doctors said, oh, you should only give her 30 minutes. She's got epilepsy. She only have 30 minutes of screen time. It's bad for her. So it just made her. Anyway, I just, uh, I thought that was interesting. There, the Times is asking people who use Summit to respond to a questionnaire and, uh, gather more information about it. But I think that that's a perfect example of the high hopes of Silicon Valley, the magic mm -hmm. that we thought was going to happen. Uh, well, the, not, not, not to beat up on Facebook anymore, although I'm about to. Um, <laughs> Please I, do. I, I have a little anecdote because th this, I think this speaks to kids and their attitudes towards things. I was talking to my daughter earlier this week and she's 18, senior in high school. And um, uh, I, I said something like, oh, you know, maybe I, I should go work for a nonprofit or something at some point. I want to go do some good in the world. And she's like, oh, don't worry, Dad. Your company does good things that you work for now. That's nice. Yeah. And it, yeah, which was very sweet. Yeah. And then she added, and anyway, it's not like you work for Facebook or anything. <laughs> I was like, whoa. It could be wow. worse, Dad. <laughs> oh, so she has a very low opinion of Facebook well, and her apparently, classmates. Apparently, people under 25, nobody's using Facebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. my, uh, she my does use Instagram. Yeah, and they don't realize they that. They don't know, and WhatsApp. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, she knows, but she, she still uses yeah. it. So, Well, Instagram isn't nearly as intrusive or obnoxious as Facebook, although, again, every ninth post there's an ad, and I fall for every one of them. <laughs> so. Instagram hasn't thrown any elections yet either, I don't think. Oh, no. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's not true. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> really? There. Now, I'm trying to remember the story, but there are... A number of weird fake Instagram accounts, fake Instagram accounts, designed to sway public opinion. There's a lot of weird stuff that happens on Instagram. Well, yeah, there's there's weird stuff. That's true. I just haven't seen any. Uh, yeah, actually, I should look into that more. No, but yeah, I wouldn't. It, it, it's gonna get there because they want to integrate Instagram with WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and everything yeah. too, like to put it all under one system. So it's a great way to get Unified. all that spam everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, yeah, there's no, the thing about Instagram, you don't have to, if you don't follow it, you don't see it. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, let's take a little break and then I'm going to give you some happy, we're going to find some happy news. We're going to find a, one way, at least one way that technology has made your life better this week. Carson, can you get on that? You got one minute. I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> Just one way. That's all I ask. Oh, wait, so, I got one. I'll tell you one way that my life is better. I'm wearing them right now, my Simple Contacts. Uh, simple Contacts, a very easy way to get contact lenses. But I have to say, I, I always run out, right? And then I got, oh, I got to make an appointment. I got to renew my prescription. So I found Simple Contacts. It's an app. It's awesome. It, it actually makes the time-consuming process of renewing your contact lens prescription very easy. Because you actually use the app, it brings the doctor's office to your home. It was so fun. I set the phone up. You have to get a certain distance from the phone. They give you an eye test. You do a video of it. And then it's reviewed by a doctor. I explained some things that are unusual about my vision. They contacted me. They said, great, okay. It's, the eye exam is $20. And then you buy the contacts. And it's very easy. And... I saved a hundred bucks on the contacts. I used to order them from another uh, online place. It was a hundred bucks less. Simple contacts. Now you should go in. I'm not. I'm, we're not saying you should replace your periodic full eye health exam. They, you know, the puff test and the. For me, I have type two diabetes. I got to get a picture of my retina every year and stuff like that. So I still believe me. I still do that. But when I run out of contacts and I need to renew, this is so much easier. I get great contact lenses. 
and I get them for less. In fact, we're going to get you an even better deal. You could save $20 on your first Simple Contacts order. That, in fact, makes the uh, eye exam free, right? Go to simplecontacts.com slash twit. Use the promo code twit at checkout. Simple Contacts. I don't know how you get your contact lenses. It, uh, I love my eye doctor, but you know what? He charges like three times more. Uh, so I started getting them online. And now I found simple contacts. Not only can I get them online for less, but I get the uh, prescription renewed as easily. It just takes a minute. Simplecontacts.com slash twit. Use the promo code twit at checkout. I'm a big fan. I got a year's worth, a year's supply. I'm wearing them right now. Can you tell? Simplecontacts.com slash twit. We thank them for their support. And uh, we thank you for supporting us by using that offer code twit. You'll save 20 bucks. Okay, a couple of bad things. Uh, horrific attacks in Sri Lanka. Um, just t terrible. Last I saw, 200 deaths. Uh, a lot of tourists. It's Easter. The Catholic churches were attacked. Tourist locations were attacked. Interesting, though, the first thing the Sri Lankan government did is take turn off Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They turned off social networks. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is that the right thing to do? Probably. I mean, what we saw happen immediately after those attacks was a lot of misinformation spreading, too. So. Yes. Yes, probably the smart move in the midst of like yeah a major terrorist event or something. When I uh, when the when Notre Dame uh, caught on fire, yeah. mm -hmm. my wife told me it was a terrorist attack because she'd been watching a YouTube feed, and YouTube paired it with a 9/11 Wikipedia article. YouTube initially misidentified it as a terrorist attack, and so it's very easy, even though YouTube fixed that quickly, for those things to accident and they escalate. Mm -hmm. The YouTube one was was automated. Yes, and YouTube you know, apologized, was... and they fixed it quickly. But nevertheless, I think it's... it caused that misapprehension. And both she and I were, like, devastated for an hour until I figured out that it wasn't. I, I thought, that's awful. Who would do that? I'm sorry, you were saying something, Dylan? Uh, yeah, no? I guess I was going to say, as long as, the, uh, as long as the social networks are unable to or unwilling to shut shut down the spread of panic um yeah. I, you know yeah. what what i mean it makes sense that governments like sri lanka are going to do exactly that they're going to do it for them apple and google blocking tiktok in india at the request uh, actually the order of the uh, indian government i'm not sure how tiktok is dangerous <laughs> all those memes porn. and music is there porn on tiktok it's too much Really? Is that why they should? Porn and everything. I that's guess why, that's why they, that's that's what they say. That's what they, they said. I mean, mostly what I saw on TikTok and is is like teenagers doing karaoke sing-alongs and yep. and Vine style videos. But I guess you can't, you know. Well, hey, good news. At least in the UK, <laughs> you'll be protected. They're going to introduce porn age checks in July. Yeah. Another pop up. Another pop up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, they, they 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 want to make all websites like commercially popular websites um, put up an age gate that asks you to prove how old you are. And there are several things that are wrong with this. The first is that um, the the sort of the group responsible for determining which websites need to put up these age gates is the group that assigns age ratings to movies and games and things like that, um, which is a, you know, a very well-intentioned um, group, but is not a specialist group and has banned some, uh, some sexual acts. I'm trying to be very family friendly here um, from appearing in commercially available um, pornography that I think is uh, questionable. Um, while allowing certain other things. Um, and the other thing is that the way that, well, one of the ways that you're going to be able to prove your age is by scanning your passport or oh. driver's license oh. and uploading it to a company who I looked into the company. It's a company called MindGeek, um, which runs websites like Pornhub. Yeah, MindGeek is, is, runs them all, basically. They're the biggest of the bunch here. So, so MindGeek says, artist, up, yeah. so you go to Pornhub, and it says, okay, you can watch, but first upload your passport or driver's <laughs> license. What could possibly oh go wrong? You know, and it's very easy to laugh about this. And, and, and you know, you should in many, uh, for many, many reasons. But the really worrying thing is that <clears throat> you look at 
what has happened in the past, and we, we talked about this earlier, I think, with the mental health app um, that was allowing, or it was mental health app or the um, fertility apps that were sharing data, is the problems that can happen when a very personal personal preference, whether that's, uh, you know, a mental health condition or sexuality or what have you, is then associated with a real world identifier leaking out. Because in many countries where we do have very liberal populations, th that's okay. You know, I say it's okay. It's not. It's terrible. It shouldn't happen. But you're not going to get stoned to death for being uh, homosexual. Whereas there are many countries in the world where you potentially could be in some very serious life-threatening danger if if certain aspects of your uh, personality or, or sexuality or whatever were, were leaked. And I find it very worrying that that's something that we're essentially relying on not happening in order to allow something um, like like a pornography site to operate legally. I have to assume misguided. that really the plan of uh, whoever in created this, I presume, parliament is not so much to get age identification as to just turn people away, like to stop using it. If you're gay and you provide your passport to a site so you can watch gay videos, that seems a very risky thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they, it they seems like it might be a GDPR problem. And too. It, yes. And it feels like what what they're figuring is, well, just people will go walk away. They're not going to do it. By the way, they there's won't. another way you don't have to. You can also go to a news agent and buy a what they call a porn pass, an age verification card that, that now only the new news agent will know who you are. <laughs> yeah. And and that costs about five pounds. You know, it's sort of, I don't know, six or seven bucks or something like that. But now you have you to know, carry I mean, a porn pass in your wallet, which doesn't seem like a good <laughs> idea either. I mean, someone said to me not long ago, you know, you know, People are just going to be too embarrassed to walk into a shop and, and buy a porn pass. And I said, well, I remember being, yeah. you know, 11, 12 years old. And I remember what you did is you put the dirty magazine inside a very respectable newspaper and then pay for the newspaper. Um, and that was a very good way of getting around that embarrassment. But um, but yeah, the, the, the bottom line is that it, it, there is there are good intentions behind the law, which is to protect children from accidentally stumbling on um, on, on yes. pornography. And that's but a very problem, difficult thing to do in the modern Internet. Very difficult. But the problem yeah. is, is how many how many kids are accidentally stumbling on pornography websites like this? They're not. If they're going to those websites it's because they're typing it in what they're stumbling across it. Oh, sorry, where they're stumbling across it are things like Twitter, Tumblr, messaging apps, TikTok. We just talked about that. And they're not covered by this because because they don't fall under the criteria of a third or more of their content being pornographic in nature. So the places where kids are accidentally stumbling on it aren't getting covered by this at yeah, all. And the places. But go ahead that, and do that, a Google search for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and see what you find. Do Kid, I want to? No. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem is that a lot of the stuff that we would might innocently search for uh turns up results that are reprehensible or just certainly not appropriate for the uh a child mm. i don't know what the answer is i mean in the states people put filtering programs on they don't work very well uh i don't know i suppose i mean i think it's a case of you you have to be seen to be doing something because if you're not seen to be doing something, then it looks like you don't care. The problem is, is that I don't, I don't think this is a good solution, and I don't think enough consultation with people who know about this kind of stuff. I don't think enough of that has happened to inform the decision here. I think people have just agreed that yes, stopping kids accidentally seeing pornography is a good thing, and I don't think too many people would disagree with that in general. Um, but this is the wrong way to go about it yeah. i think it's uh it's very it's troubling I, I don't think there's any any good answer and i really feel bad for a generation of children that's growing up basically without innocence of any kind mm -hmm. um you know some might say oh that's you know without ignorance of any kind but i don't think so because the stuff that uh kids are seeing in porn is not normal love not normal sexuality but uh but a but a bizarre kind of sexuality and uh I, I i see it in kids they they don't have that that innocence anymore and i think that's sad uh all right karsten did you find a good story i found three. Oh and man you, you win a, a security one a products one or a gaming one all right let's start with security okay the security one is uh strangely enough in utah utah bans police 
thank God, from searching digital data without a warrant. First state in the nation to ban warrantless searches of electronic data. Did you know that was legal? One wouldn't think so. Under the Electronic Information or Data Privacy Act, HP 57, state law enforcement can only access someone's transmitted or stored digital data. That would include emails, writing, images, audio, if a court issues a search warrant based on probable cause. The act ensures that search engines, email providers, social media, cloud storage, and any other third-party electronic communication service or remote computing service is fully protected under the Fourth Amendment. Hallelujah. That's a great precedent. Yay. Let's, let's hope it sticks. Yeah, one state, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Okay, that's good. You win, Carson. Give me another one. Uh, the second story concerns uh, Google and Amazon coming to terms. I know. Is this a good story? It's I don't know. Story. Amazon and Google <laughs> have settled their feud, which means now what? You can buy Fire devices. It's Fire good for TV Fire TV devices. owners who didn't have you YouTube, YouTube for a year on, because of the spat. So oh, that's, that was super dumb. YouTube is back on Fire TV. Yeah. Remember when you yeah. couldn't watch YouTube on Apple TV? Well, this was like that. <laughs> Now, but <laughs> they're so petty. They, these companies are so petty. It's so insane. petty. I actually don't like Fire TV because it just seems like a big ad for Amazon. Oh yeah. Is anyone using it? I have it. I have the Cube because you could talk to it. I use. I it. think it's also very popular because we were talking about like you know default browsers and stuff. Amazon really pushes their default hardware. Right. So people looking for streaming sticks or something, I think, I think get most of people Fire TV. who are using Fire TV sticks are using it to pirate stuff. To be honest. With you. <laughs> yes. That's yes. The, that's the real answer to that question. Um, finally, you said you have a gaming story. Uh, yes. Uh, just this week, uh, Nintendo uh, released a patch or a, an update to Super Smash Brothers Ultimate that lets you uh, uh, make your own stages. And it's uh, lots of people are making lots of cool stages. And you uh, are a geek. I am a geek. Uh, my it's son super cool. has actually created his own uh, Twit-based what uh, Super Smash Brothers level, but I can't show it to you because it it has some. It violates some, our copyright. It violates somebody else's copyright. There's, there's, a, there's an audio issue that violates somebody else's copyright, but I will put it in the uh, in the show notes for our audience to. Are to you check saying out. you want to avoid yet another YouTube takedown of this fine program? Yeah, yeah, I kind we, of. We're, Jerry we're, would get really <laughs> mad at me. So far, we I don't think we've done anything that YouTube would hold against us. But let's not start. Mm -hmm. I thought you, by the way, that is very good news. Uh, I guess. I don't know. I thought you might say something about this Assassin's Creed Unity, which, among other things, takes place nice. in Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. In order to make it, they laser scanned the entire cathedral a couple of years ago. And those laser scans, which are incredibly detailed, will be used to reconstruct. That's pretty cool. After the, the best fire. thing to come out of a terrible game. It's great. <laughs> is it a terrible yeah. game? <laughs> it's it's really bad. It's notoriously like buggy and rush and yada no. yada. But this is pretty this is pretty cool. I'm surprised. Were you guys excited by the PlayStation 5 hardware too? Because that or whatever that's gonna be called. Because the the bits we heard were pretty cool. So this was a leak, or because uh, no, it was it was an exclusive, like just a a hint at the hardware that interview. Wired got. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, because E3 is coming up, so we're going to learn a, a lot more, obviously. Well, they're not participating in E3. So oh. that's, the, that's the big thing this year is Sony I is doing its it. own thing. They're doing these like video uh, direct announcements like Nintendo's been doing. So we got a glimpse of this hardware, and it seems pretty cool. Seven eight -core. nanometer uh, Zen yeah. processor, eight-core processor. That's one of the mm -hmm. AMD Ryzen. Pro seven nanometers, wow. Seven nanometers, and upcoming, like upcoming GPU uh, I think they're really, you know, all, all the hardware you expect. One of the things they really mentioned, though, is this, like, next-generation SSD technology, maybe using the the next version of PCIe, I guess. Um, but it's uh, it, it's supposedly going to be able to, like, load games almost instantly. And I think that's huge because that's been the big problem for gaming consoles. Is yeah. The past few generations, you're installing games. They have to go to the hard drive. You have to wait for them to load. You're using slow, rotating laptop hard drives. Not great. So having a, an SSD, maybe an NVMe type thing uh, that loads super quickly, that could be huge. Um, this so new I'm GP, excited about that. This new GPU they're going to use 
much like the new NVIDIA RTX GPUs will support uh, hardware ray tracing. Mm -hmm. and We're I'm not glad... quite sure what that means, but yeah, yeah. it could. Yeah. Well, that could be huge. That allows games to do amazing uh, realistic lighting and smoke effects and so forth. Ray mm -hmm. tracing is a really neat technology. We saw uh, a, an update of, uh, what was it, uh, Doom uh, done and ray traced with the new... Uh, Quake 2. Oh, it was Quake, Quake 2. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. with a new... Uh, nvidia processor and it was really beautiful looks amazing i yeah. mean that tech is that has a huge potential the pc side hasn't really seen many games supported but i think as it comes to consoles and developers like learn to use it that could that could be huge that could be amazing we still don't quite know what that means though we don't know if it's like dedicated ray tracing hardware uh. like that's on the nvidia cards or are they going to do it like through other processing means which could be more costly uh, th there's still a lot left up in the air. I'm just really excited about the loading thing. And, you know, it, it sounds like the hardware is going to be a step up all around. And you didn't mention the most important number. It will mm -hmm. be potentially 8K. Oh, let's not even, let's not go down this road. <laughs> is anybody, anybody talking about 8K right now is a liar and a fraud. <laughs> and uh, like, they're trying to sell you something because yeah, they're saying like, oh yeah, it, it could potentially run 8K maybe for like a 2D stick figure game or something because <laughs> The amount of processing power needed for 8K at a native resolution is insane. If you uh, let's, add let's stick with 4K for 8K now. Yeah, to 5G, you're going to get 13GK. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. So good. That's that's by the way, I just I want to patent 13KG, 13 kilograms. That's the new <laughs> acronym for the brand new tech century that Nate says is going to be amazing. Thank you. You heard it here first. Thank you for all the bandwidth, all the resolution, <laughs> all the bandwidth you could possibly handle. And it's going to fix all the moral problems with the current yes, generation. Absolutely. Of technology. Facebook will suddenly be private and secure, just like Mark promised. <laughs> 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 Nate Langston, thank you so much for being here. He is a tech a tech editor at Bloomberg. Are you in London? I, uh, I'm in London, yes. Oh, and, I am. and we ran out of time for your drum solo. I apologize. That's okay. I can record it and send it in later. We'll edit it in to the final edition. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nate, for staying up late with us. I really appreciate it. No, my, my pleasure. We'll Thank you for soon. having me. At Nate Langson, L-A-N-X-O-N on the Twitter. Mm. We're always thrilled to have Dylan uh, Tweeney on with us. He is, uh, of course, long-timer at Venture Beaten Wire, but now head of communication at Valamail, V-A-L-I-M-A-I-L.com. If you are sending email from your business, uh, Valamail does that uh, validation that means it's authentic, and I think that's real. I'm a big supporter of that. I think that's really important. So thank you for being here, Dylan. It's great to be back, Leo. It's really nice to, to talk with you. Yeah. I feel like uh, both you and Nate, we should get you on more. We, I don't. I apologize for not being uh, more aggressive about pursuing you. And Devendra, I would. I would. Yeah. You want to come back? You want to come back? I'll always come. All right. Always come back. Yeah. I'll come All right. back. Let's do it again. You know, we'll do it again. I'll plug my own podcast next time. Oh, what's your podcast? <laughs> oh, you know, I should everybody. Everybody has a freaking podcast. I oh should, yeah. I should yeah. ask everybody. What's your podcast, Nate? Oh my 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 podcast. My podcast is called Text Message. So can like I text. get it on my phone? Of course you can get it on your phone. Yeah. Using Tech Apple's podcast, messages. You can get it on any device where a podcast can be oh, found. I get it. Yeah. T E C H apostrophe S. There you go. That's very clever. Oh, I like it. Thank you. Yeah. We went into quite a lot of detail on the, um, on the porn age gate stuff. Cause there's so much behind that story to unpack. So we, we went into pretty good detail about that. Um, yeah. Techpodcasts.uk. Excellent. Well, welcome any new listeners, of course. Excellent. Text message. Oh, I'm going to have to start listening. That looks great. Do you? Is it you alone or you said we? Who else is on it with it's, you? It's me, my co-host, Ian Morris. Uh, so he and I used to work at CNET together back in sort of 2007. He's, he's written through like Gizmodo, Forbes, and, and other places. But um, I have sort of a rotating panel who, who come on every now and again, like Tom Merritt's been on. He's a good friend of mine. Um, a bunch of other people have been on too. So nice. Yeah, it's it's good fun nice. every week. That sounds fantastic. I shall listen from now on. Thank you. How about uh, how about you, Dylan? You got a, you got a podcast? 
I do not have a podcast at what? the moment. I'm sorry, Leo. Uh, bring me on again, and I'll yeah, you I'll can have be on ours. Okay, have a podcast I'll... next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that. Everybody has a podcast. I know. I know this guy, Devendra Hardwar, does. Oh, He's I do. Senior editor and gadget. And uh, what is your podcast? Oh, I do the Slash Filmcast. That's the SlashFilm.com. So we review movies and TV shows. We're about ready to start our summer movie wager, Ooh. which is this fun thing we do every summer where we basically predict the top 10 movies of the, the summer season and you know, try to see who wins at the end. And whoever wins has to force everybody to watch a movie of their own choosing. Nice. So, yeah, prepping for that. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm also doing a tech show at nomoretech.net, and that's no with a K. And it's like just answering people's questions and talking about like timely news and stuff. Sometime this podcast thing is going to really take off, and you guys gonna good. are going to be millionaires. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it's all for the love of it right now, yeah. just talking to microphones. I love that. Uh, believe me, I know. Uh, <laughs> at, at Devendra on the Twitter. Yes, Thank you and everything being. else at Engadget. Yes, and we love having you on, too. As often as we can. It's great to have. What a great panel. Thank you guys for being great here. Great panel. Yep. We do Twit every uh, Sunday afternoon, even on Easter, uh, round about, right after the radio show. So it depends how long it gets, uh, get, takes us to get started, around about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern time. Uh, that would be 21.30 UTC. Come by, say hi, watch the show. You can watch it live or listen live at twit.tv slash live. You can also, if you're doing that, join us in the chat room because there's always a great conversation uh, going on in there. That's irc.twit.tv. On-demand versions of the show are always available at our website for everything we do, twit.tv. And uh, if you want, the best thing to do would be subscribe. That way you get it automatically the minute it's available so you have it in time for your Monday commute. Uh, just go to twit.tv or your favorite podcast application and click subscribe. I'm offering uh, for sale uh, from my life, my shop, the <laughs> ultimate spin face scrubber and the Smile Bright Store UV sanitizer toothbrush uh, at a, <laughs> at a uh, garage sale near you. So just come by. <laughs> Pick it up. We've got a deal. <laughs> a really big deal. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time. Another twin is in the game.